Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, we are here in, what, where do we call this? This is uh, Bozeman, Montana. The Randy Room is what my wife calls it. Man we're up, cave. We're upstairs in my office uh, where all the dead animals are allowed to exist. Uh, we are just back from a Montana moose hunt. And one thing we discovered in that process is these three guys are all in their 20s and I'm in my 50s. Moose hunting is something more suited for 20-year-olds and 50-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. Walking in swamps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was tough yeah. for a 24-year-old too, like really? me. Yeah. I had, I had a hard time there for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Okay, so I don't have feel all that bad. So when I woke up yeah, don't feel and that had bad. rigor mortis really bad, I think I had rig worse than that moose did. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, folks, we're going to talk about all kinds of cool things. Uh, we're going to talk about moose hunting, a uh, little bit about grizzly bears, uh, a lot about public land, uh, a lot about all the books I read. I set them all out here. I thought, you know what, since we're doing this at our house, I'm going to pull my the books that I've read in the last year off the bookshelf, and we're going to go through them all. Well, not all, but people ask it a lot. So what the heck? May as well talk about it. Um, we're going to talk about public access and wherever, whatever else you guys want to talk about. But Marcus, yeah. you, you got to talk. Nodding your head doesn't come across very good on a podcast. Well, I just I feel like I'm always just saying, okay, all right. <laughs> sounds good. And I just have those one word responses, you know, okay. Yep. <laughs> and Matthew, you're the man of many words, right? Yeah. I mean, before we started filming, you told the camera guys that their goal was to get me to say more than yes or no. Right. So. <laughs> did, did you guys get him to say more than yes or no? It was yeah. honestly a short hunt. I mean, we. I mean, we got the one day done, and then I was with you the next day. So yeah, I mean, did you get him when you guys yeah, spotted we, that moose, Marcus? Yeah, we got a, a segment bit. segment in there. He said, good. "Ooh, I'll shoot that one." That's about it. Yeah, yeah. So in Arizona, <laughs> in Arizona, we calculated we had like twelve seconds of elk footage before I shot. <laughs> On this hunt, I think we've got what a minute of Matthew's dialogue before he uh, shoots. Yeah, I, th I would say around that. Okay. Maybe a little more. He takes after my grandfather. My grandfather was one of those World War II vets, and if he said two words that day, you better be paying attention because that's probably all you were going to get that day. So mm -hmm. is that true, Matthew? Yeah. Uh, kind of, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Uh, there you go. There, there's our, there's, a, there, there's our two words from Matthew today. So I don't know. A podcast with uh, quiet 20-some-year-olds, 27-year-olds, and 24-year-olds probably isn't a good thing. But anyhow, this podcast brought to you by Leupold. Uh, anyone wearing the Leupold stuff besides me? Matthew, you don't have a hat on. I didn't know no, we were filming today. You didn't know we were filming. Yeah, we film all of these when we're at home. All right. Well, next time. Well, but you're okay. You're wearing, you're wearing I'm your Sitka hat. Marcus is wearing his, uh, he's repping the colors for Bo Beatty and the uh, Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas. Yeah. That, that. I like folks, this hat. That's I know. Really and nice and hat. folks, <laughs> if you haven't been out to our YouTube channel to watch our whole segment about hunting with llamas in the Wind River Range, did we ever do it? We never got Bo on the podcast because the blizzard hit and we had to no, leave. Yeah, we need to do that. We're catching up with Bo to do a podcast here pretty soon, but, uh, that was uh, that was really really cool. So you can watch all that out on our our YouTube channel. And Matthew, he's just I don't know. Got a jacket on. No hat though. All right. Got to have the the branded. Even yeah, you podcast. need something. I mean, uh, oh, I don't have <laughs> any. <laughs> I had to have my loop pulled hat on. Now I feel like I got my hunt talk yeah, hat on. Yeah, yeah, you do. Huh. Anyhow, <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Leupold. Uh, they sponsor everything we do, from the podcast to the YouTube channel to the TV show to Hunt Talk Forum, everything. And they are huge, huge supporters of public land, of conservation, of hunting. Uh, I hope that you will support them the way that they support us. Um, the other one, Go Hunt, and... Uh, uh, Go hunt. When's this podcast going to drop on Monday, Sunday, or Monday, Matthew? You're in charge of the podcast schedule. It's yeah. going to uh, look at the couple calendar. days from now. So it's probably going to drop on October 29th or 30th. So that means if you are a, interested in the Go Hunt program, 
And they have this insider service that I use. And so many of you are like, Randy, how do you draw all these tags? Well, you need some really good research products. Uh, my primary research for applications is Go Hunt. Um, and right now, if you sign up by, let's see, they're running this through October 31st. So there will still be two or three days where people can sign up for the 30-day free trial. Uh, if you go there, they go to Go Hunt dot com forward slash randy there's a 30-day free trial that they will give you you can see everything how we use it uh the draw odds the over the counter the unit analysis everything uh so go to gohunt.com forward slash randy and sign up for your 30-day free, free trial but if you wait until november 1st the 30-day free trial is gone so uh hopefully you'll take advantage of that other research tool once we have our tags Onyx Maps is, is, is there anyone who isn't a big fan of Onyx Maps? I love it. Down here, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's great. Yeah, I mean, uh, even, but, even they, they've even accommodated old guys like me. <laughs> I mean, this right here, I, I'm trying to figure out how I hunted without this before, I, I don't know, on the day of paper maps and everything else, but, the other thing they came up with just last week, they released the waypoint sharing feature where you can share the, the waypoints with other people on, who are on the Onyx system. Uh, but it's, besides that, I mean, ownership, burns, roadless layers. I mean, the number of things that you can find that are right here. And so many people think that you got to have cell service and you don't. How, uh, if you had to guess, how many offline maps do you guys have stored on your phone, Marcus? You well, need a bigger. You you need a bigger I phone. I delete them. I I, use, I just like continually yeah. change them out for yeah. wherever we're going. Yeah. But it, I did find out another perk of having the app is when you have your GPS. Yeah. And then you drop it in the river, and you don't have your GPS anymore. <laughs> you have a redundant <laughs> system. <laughs> Marcus and then, is, and Marcus is the... speaking from experience <laughs> because he has a GPS laying in the bottom of the Missouri River as of about five days, yeah. about a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> but fortunately, you had your phone, and so you had redundancy. Yep, that, that's another huh. key part. <laughs> you know, I've never I, – I lost my GPS for about four months, I hid it in my pickup someplace because I'm like, I don't want someone to see this and steal it out of my truck. So I, I'm like, well, I'll never forget where it's at. Well, I forgot where it was. <laughs> I'm in panic mode. I'm like, all my waypoints, all my trails, everything's on there. And I was getting rid of, actually, I bought another GPS to replace it. And I'm like, oh man, I'm so glad I backed all this up. Well, then I'm out cleaning out the truck, getting ready for bear season. I'm like, whoa. Here's my GPS. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, Onyx is, a huge, again, a huge supporter of everything we do. Uh, Matt Seidel from Onyx. Did you, did, were you, did you guys see the elk he killed in yeah. Nevada yesterday? Oh, no. I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Did he, he posted it online? Uh, I, I don't know if he posted it online, but uh, he sent it to me, and he sent me the screenshot of where he killed it. Um, I've got it right here on my phone. This is a Nevada bull. Uh, but you know that burn layer thing that they do? Yeah. Oh, dang. That's a nice one, huh? That's cool. I they can't see wow. that from there. but So here's where he shot it. Look at that burn. Ooh, he shot about it about how yep. you can't see nods on the podcast and now you're showing pictures around. <laughs> I mean, we are filming it. We couldn't, yeah. in theory, put screenshots Anyhow, up. But, I, I know uh, you can't see this either, but Matt sent me the screenshot of where he killed the bull <laughs> and there's a burn layer right there. <laughs> Everyone watching on YouTube yeah. just freeze-framed yeah. right yeah. there and is trying to zoom in <laughs> to that spot. And Matt says, guess where I find elk after five days of looking for them in Nevada? In a burn. <laughs> so, That's funny. Hey, yeah, that, the, you can get all these burn layers uh, with Onyx Maps. And we use it, I mean, to no end. I mean, yeah. for me, I love the, you guys, uh, and this is mostly Marcus and Michael being more technologically advanced than I am. I've become a bigger fan of the smartphone because of the detail you can get on the map yeah. layers. Like when you're like, well, 
are, uh, what's on the other side of that ridge? You can look and see if it's open or if it's a rock or whatever it is. It's just tons and tons of cool stuff. But for that, if you want to, I'd go to onxmaps.com. And if you use promo code Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, uh, you're going to get 20% off their app products, not their chip products, but the app products. And then uh, Orion Coolers uh, is another great sponsor of all that we do. And uh, we, you got one of those coolers in the back of your yep. truck, Michael. Don't be, do. don't be making off with it. You might never see it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were down in New Mexico on an elk hunt. Marcus, you were on that hunt. And we left that cooler outside when we got there. You and I got there on a Wednesday. And we left on a Tuesday. And we didn't do anything special. We just put block ice in there because we had that antelope with us. Mm -hmm. When we left six days later, that block ice was still in that cooler, hardly <laughs> melted at all. So anyhow, OrionCoolers.com, go there, get the coolest colors in the in the cooler world, but also the best coolers that I've found. And uh, use promo code Randy when you buy one, and you're going to get this really cool tumbler for your coffee, your beer, your water, whatever you want to drink. So... With that, let's talk about moose hunting. Sounds good. Michael, you ever draw a moose tag? <laughs> no. Marcus? Nope. I've got whatever the maximum amount of bonus points is for a moose tag in Montana. In Montana. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've applied 27 times. I've never drawn a moose tag. Yeah. Matthew, you ever draw a moose tag? Uh, yeah, I drew once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you applied 16 times and you finally drew. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One of the right. guys I met on uh, on the road when we were hunting said that he had been applying for like forty three years. Really? Hasn't, I hasn't think my dad's around. somewhere in that range too. Wow. It's like wow. That's a the, and the crazy part is just over the the mountains where we were at in I if you went just over the mountains into Idaho in Idaho they have a different system where you can only apply for moose or apply for sheep, or apply for goat. You can apply for all three, like you can in a lot of states. And if you apply for one of those three, you can't apply for the special permits for elk, deer, or antelope. Hmm. Huh. So you kind of have to make your choice in Idaho. I'm going to do elk, deer, or antelope, and forego the other three, or I'm going to do one of the other three, moose, goat, or sheep. And so the draw odds in Idaho, even for non-residents, are really, really good for right. moose. Uh, I might have to apply there next year because uh, I saw one yesterday oh, that I didn't did tell you, you guys about. <laughs> in Idaho? Yeah. Really? When you were heading over the hill? Mm-hmm. It's, it's big. Big? It was really big. <laughs> Uh-oh. I got some footage. Cool. Well, <laughs> so after we left the moose hunt yesterday, Marcus decides he's got an antelope tag in Montana, so he kind of bushwhacks like Jim Bridger style. How, <laughs> how, how does your truck handle that? Pretty good? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So Marcus <laughs> no. leaves. He's loaded down. He looks like he the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, he's got junk everywhere in his truck, and he goes and shoots an antelope yesterday. Yeah. So, how was that? It's easy. Easy. <laughs> no. Filmed himself. We now have a guy. We don't need a host anymore. We have a camera guy and a host who can film himself and host it. I don't think it's going to be like very good quality stuff. Really? Well, I don't know. We'll was see. he as big as he looked in the picture? No. No? No, he's quite small, actually. Okay. Marcus <laughs> Marcus is like our trick photographer. Michael is the photographer we use when we're going to send images to, to sponsors. <laughs> when, when you see stuff on our Instagram page or on our Facebook page where you're like, holy cow, look at that thing they killed. Those are photo credit to Marcus. <laughs> Marcus has this wide angle lens that you can take a picture from mm, six inches away and it looks like you're 30 feet away and it takes up the whole frame like someone sent me that picture you took of matthew's uh moose walking out oh yeah someone sent me a, a text mess or a, an instagram message asking if that was a 60 inch moose <laughs> <laughs> it was what we measured it yesterday about 45 45 and a half yeah so but nice. that that's marcus's other role in, in this gig is uh the the trick photography. Well, I showed you that picture of that deer, right? Where you stand about 60 mm -hmm. feet back. Oh, we need to post that somewhere on <laughs> yeah. one of our things. Just as humor to show that Marcus is really good at this. He shot... Uh, who shot the deer, Skylar? My friend Skylar, yeah. yeah. 
And so Marcus has his wife and Skylar go stand by each antler about... F- that's a kind of the Utah method, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that what guys call that, the Utah method, where you go stand way behind the animal? And they have their hands right up next to the antler, and it looks like they're... Uh, what was it? Gulliver? Is he the guy in the Lilliputians or whatever, the, the little people? I don't know. I, I can't remember. <laughs> Anyhow. But that's what they look like. The deer looks bigger than them. <laughs> so... We we we've got it all covered here. I and I'm I really don't do anything. <laughs> I just sit around and tell BS stories. You're the one who talks on the podcast. <laughs> I know. Well, you guys. I don't know if you didn't have your coffee this morning or what the hell, but you get. Oh, Michael's drinking coffee, so give oh, him yeah. about twenty minutes. Yeah. He'll be ready to go. Marcus is wore out from moose hunting and antelope hunting, so. Uh, I don't know. We might just hit the pause button and let you guys go do some calisthenics or something. <laughs> get, get warmed up. But so, Matthew, you're gonna have to say more than two words. Why is that? Well, you got you. We got you to three. Uh, because I want to know. I want to hear your version of the moose hunt because. I was gone when you and Marcus saw this moose. Yeah. Michael drove me over to that other mountain so I could get on a conference call for my Elk Foundation board service. And when we came back, you guys were all wound up. Something happened in the interim there. Yeah. Well, we spent about an hour trying to just get footage and uh, photos of this thing. So we, you guys left. We were looking at a group of other ones that were out there and then noticed that there was one that was fairly larger than the rest of them and just kept an eye on it for a while and watched it bed down. That's pretty much it. Well, I mean, they were definitely on the move too, so we wanted to... I, I was kind of excited. I was like, we should just go, should just, just go kill just that. Just go get it. But were, I think it was good. We waited for you guys. So. Yeah. I could tell you guys when we were, when we were driving <laughs> up, yeah. you guys were both looking in the same direction. I could see it in Marcus's face. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's go. We got to well, go. go. It was, yeah. it was amazing because I mean, in those willows, once you drop into them, you kind of lose everything. You don't know what's what, but that moose bedded on the perfect line. There was two spruce trees in a line, in line with a peak of a mountain. It was like, you couldn't ask for a better vector to follow. And so that was, we got really lucky with that, I think. That, yeah. And then you guys showed up and just screwed around for an hour and not believing that we saw anything. <laughs> well, so was, Marcus and I were like ready to go get our gear well, on to go chase after it. And you guys stood and, around. And, and a little bit of reason why that is, I told Michael as we're driving back over there, I said, I, they're going to have some sort of BS prank on us or they're going to act all excited just because we're gone. Yeah. So when we show up and you guys are all excited, it's like, okay, that's exactly what... I knew they were going to do. You guys are following the script, trying to jerk my chain. And the, I think what convinced me is, Marcus, you pulled up the footage. Yeah. And you said, look in that viewfinder. I'm like, <laughs> I... And so it, it kind of faked me out. I'm like, am I looking at the real in, real-time image or am I looking at a recorded image on the camera? Well, so. And not to mention, when we went over for that phone call, we found two pretty good moose. One right. of them being... 200 yards from the road. Yeah. yeah. We, and the ones that you guys found are, what, like a mile? Yeah. A mile in there. Too, too far. So, <laughs> I mean, I what? wasn't going to jerk your chain and make us go on a chase of something that wasn't there in the swamp. Well, no. I, I, <laughs> once, once you guys were shouldering your packs, I'm like, you know, these guys are serious. And, I, mm-hmm. I feel like you're losing trust in me. Not in the Arizona elk hunt. And what, <laughs> well, what did I do to it? No, no it's, not, it's not losing trust. It's just I'm feeling like, you know, grandpa, when you kind of move his, his spittoon cup around, you know, <laughs> he's walking around trying to find it. And, he, and everyone thinks it's funny to pull a joke on grandpa because he can't find his spittoon anymore. And so that's, I'm worried. I'm like, all right, I'm kind of the brunt of the humor here. I think, so. I think we need to back up in this story too. We're sure. kind of, we're kind of like I know jumping that, to the end. I was hoping Matthew would give some of that story, but you, you're the one who's like, tell us about the day that we had the phone <laughs> no, call. I, <laughs> that's right in the middle of it. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, tell us about your hunt. Yeah. And you jumped right into no. the, I saw <laughs> and, him. And, and then you we we interjected with, oh, oh, we went and had a phone call and father, son. All right. Thanks. So, All right. so let's, <laughs> you, you led me on there. Let's, let's, you told me to do something, and then you okay. led me to a different direction. All right. I'm sorry, so. Dan. So 
let, then let's we can start all over. Where where do you guys want to start? Let's from start here? from leaving Bozeman. That's okay. a, I mean that's pretty far back, but <laughs> I mean we drove to our location and go yep. on go on now, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> we drove to the location. We left here at what? I don't know. Sometime right. in the morning. Yeah, we had to go to Sitka Gear and get a bunch of clothing. Yep. Had to make sure that I was all set up. Uh went out there and saw a couple pretty much right after we got there, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think we were there for probably half hour and we started. Oh, right. Yeah. We spotted what a, that cow way out there. And yeah. And it was like middle of the day. Right. Yeah. That know? one bull like stood up. Or right around noon, one o'clock or something yeah. like that. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. how they can disappear in those willows. It's amazing. Yeah. And then like once, Completely once they banish. start moving, you're like, oh my God, there are moose everywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, wh- where did they all come from? <laughs> yeah. So we, what happened? We saw two to three bulls that were out in the willows. And so yeah, we saw, what, three, right? And we're three. looking for the big one. Yeah, there was yeah. one that was pretty nice. Yeah, which we're, it, we're not sure if that was the one that I shot or not, but close enough. <laughs> so, I, I think it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it, it was. But w- the the bummer is I never got any good footage of that moose that well, day. Well, and there you was, couldn't. He was, he was like yeah. in the willows and you just and like... there was mirage and... Yeah, the was, heat waves yeah. and all that. I mean, they were a long yeah. ways away. Yeah. So we we went, kind of chased after those. Um, wound up seeing two of them fighting with each other, which was pretty yeah. cool. Um, had them at 100, 200 yards, something like that. And I decided to not shoot. And... So... Uh, but it. those are the but, two... Yeah, smaller, two smaller ones. ones. Yeah. And we're yeah. looking for the bigger one. Yeah. But the thing about those smaller ones is that neither one of them were really that small. No. no. <laughs> Compared to what no. most Montana moose that I see. No. I, that, like I told you guys, if I was the tag holder, we would have been packing moose yeah. right there. But I, uh, yeah. So let's talk about your hip boot situation. Yeah. Matthew. So, so <laughs> is that part of why you didn't shoot the first day? Uh, I mean, partially. Uh, so <laughs> the... The entire area is basically one giant bog or swamp. Or yeah. I don't know what the actual technical term for it is. You should know, Marcus. Swamp. We'll call yeah, it. I, I don't know. I'd have to Google that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, there's a lot of standing water. There's a lot of very unstable ground. And so we were wearing either rubber boots or waders or things like that. And I made the mistake of not having a pair that fit very well. So my feet were sliding all around and made it twice as hard to get through anything. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> and I'll was... take credit for that. We, we, <laughs> went, we went to buy some hip boots in Bozeman, Montana. You cannot find hip boots in Bozeman, Montana. That's unbelievable. What a stupid thing. <laughs> it, huh. Everything was, was chest waders. Well, who wants to, if, you, if you're going to be hiking for miles, who yeah. wants to wear chest waders when yeah. I'm never hiking someplace up to my armpits anyhow in the water? Yeah. I audibled so, out of my chest waders. So yeah. that that's why Matthew, we said, well, I got, or Randy got two pair of hip boots. Let's, uh, let's just put on some extra layers of socks, put a felt liner in there and we'll go. Yeah. So day one didn't work very well was sliding all around. Day two, I put Marcus's Crocs inside <laughs> the, the hip boots. Pro tip right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh. <laughs> Worked a little better, but was still not great. And then we discovered that Marcus had some rubber boots in the back of his truck that actually fit me. Yeah, so. sorry. I kind of forgot about the <laughs> the muck boots. No. They're kind of like part of my kit for getting my pickup unstuck. Oh. And so oh, this, yeah. like, you have the muck boots that are ready. Yeah. They're just always in there. I forgot. Yeah, I, I have Luckily. a pair, pair of muck boots, but they're kind of like my hurry up and check muskrat kind of boots Ooh, you know nice. that, if i don't want to go full hippers mm-hmm. I, i'd go muck style but so i was wondering if that's why you passed on those bulls that first uh, night matthew because of no how miserable it was to i mean i was not imagine, happy but yeah it, that was not the primary thing i knew neither of those were the one that we looked at okay and i also knew that we had several days left in the hunt yeah and also it was getting dark and i didn't like the idea of you know quartering and Packing the thing out in the dark in grizzly uh, country. In grizzly country, <laughs> <laughs> especially in the the terrain where 
there's already a bunch of things that can trip you up and so just trying to do that in the dark sounded like yeah. not very much fun so. no i <clears throat> i was good with you passing i, I mean I, I mean it's your tag so i'm good no matter what but uh when you decided now nah, i'm not gonna shoot a little bit of my oh come on come on a little bit of that was like me feigning uh, my disappointment because i was thinking the same thing i'm like you know this place is loaded with grizzly bears and i'm sure the bears are more active at night than they are during the day there's a lot of stories recently of people encountering grizzlies too kind of yeah keep your guard up like. right so i'm thinking all right so we got uh, i don't know how many hundreds of pounds of moose guts and meat and carcass laying out here and we're gonna be uh, like going through rabbit tr- tunnels through the willow brush in the dark yeah i i mean the time that i would have shot one of those was what an hour before sunset so it's yeah we would have been gutting and gilling even in the dark. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have finished with that until it was well past dark. Yeah. Morning, baby. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you made the right decision. Yeah. In, in spite of my enthusiasm for mm-hmm. wanting to shoot one of those. But I didn't know how many moose were in that area. I thought, well, we lucked out. We found the five moose in this unit. <laughs> That's another part why I was so excited. So. Yeah. Well, you said that they counted like 160 of them there. In the, in the winter count. Yeah. yeah, they come there in the winter, though, because it's such great habitat. But how many did we see the next morning? 20-some. Well, over 20 for sure. It's yeah. hard to tell. Like, because, right. you, you know, some disappear, and you're not sure which ones are the same, but it's like yeah. confirmed over 22, I think, or 21, yeah. something like that. So bef- before you continue with your story, Michael's driving me over to that knob over there where you get cell coverage. Hold on. Let's back up. What happened was we were driving back into the unit that morning. Yeah. Saw two right off the side of the road. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I That would have been tempting right there. I mean, <laughs> those were nice bulls. <laughs> I mean, but the <laughs> thing is, they were a little, they, those two bulls, we thought they were the same ones that you had passed on that day before, but then. On closer yeah. inspection, there's like, nope, nope, those are two different, different. bulls. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, there's four nice bulls, like, within yeah. a close spot, yeah. you know. And, and I I commented to somebody, I'm like, I've never got an elk out hole. Can you imagine if we got a moose out hole? I, 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 I still, still don't I still think, think we would have. Like, 200 yards. <laughs> <laughs> no. <Nope>. But, <clears throat> so you passed on those. Yeah. Uh, much to our back and our legs. Uh, what were you saying yeah. that closeness to the truck makes things bigger? Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> I think that Boone and Crockett on the score sheet for Moose should say, how far were you from the truck? And that's like some sort of factor that you, right. If, that, if, that's factored into the score. Right. If you, if it is, you know, within a quarter mile of the road, you should get extra points. So and if it's like, uphill from the road, you should get even more extra points. It's like a an inch deduction for every mile it, or every half mile it is from the road. Something like yeah. that. And I think if you shoot it a mile, <laughs> if you shoot it a mile out in the swamp, you should you should be disqualified from entering that. I don't know that. I, mean, I feel like that might be opposite of Boone and Crockett's fair chase. So. <laughs> I, 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 I think you're right. <laughs> I, I think it's completely opposite. I'm I, just saying. I, I think you just disliked having to pack out meat and swamp i i do my <laughs> there is something about packing meat in the swamp and if you've never hunted moose in alaska everyone should go do it because it's fun until you shoot one but <laughs> you get a whole new appreciation for packing stuff out in terrible conditions because we are here when we're elk hunting we're often packing up steep hills or down or side hill and we're complaining but there's something just completely different about water up to your knees where you never know what your foot is stepping on and it's sliding and rolling and you're stepping on those what are they yeah, called the hummocks the hummocks yeah, yeah. yeah. well it's just those the ground's okay. so un, unstable yeah. too like yeah. when we were processing mm-hmm. that moose like i can't remember michael like jumped jumping. up and down a little bit yeah. and then you could feel i could feel the ground moving you know yeah, 10 like, feet away yeah, over 10 feet away it's pretty crazy yeah yeah, yeah. so i mean other aspects getting your boots stuck in the the mud when you're trying to take a step or randomly stepping in one of the big holes yeah you sink oh down yeah those <laughs> random holes thigh. where you just <laughs> yeah just and you tip down. over i tipped yep. over only one time packing that that one load out but 
Fortunately, I fell forward and I was able to grab onto some willows. Otherwise, That's I, good. I could yep. have been rolling around there like a... I would have been like a flounder there with about 75 pounds on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, luckily... <laughs> There'd be a cross there. Here lies Randy Newberg, <laughs> drowning <laughs> two feet of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not that's face first. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I f- uh, well, but you don't feel those holes in the bog no. until all of a sudden you put your foot down and you're like, okay, that's sturdy. Yeah. And you put all your weight on it and all of a sudden your foot breaks through something. Yeah. And down you go, and we. I, I don't, or it's mud, and it, you just step on it, and it. You yeah, know, it's mud, a foot and a half deep. <laughs> yeah, it's. So I'm sure people listening are like, "Oh, gee, I feel so sorry for you guys," but they don't. They're not feeling the aches and pains. I'm feeling two days later. Yeah. But no, that right now doesn't it? You look back on it, and you're like, "That was that was fun." Oh, even yeah, though it was now, a little yeah. bit, you know, misery at the time. For sure. No, once we got back to the truck, I was like, "Man, that was fun." But while we were toting that stuff across there, I wasn't really whistling Dixie or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Took us what seven hours to pack it out a mile from the kill site to the truck. Yeah, yeah, about that. Something like that. I don't yeah, know. that yeah. sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's four of us. Uh, yeah. We're doing this in a very non-chronological order. No, but yeah, that, that's all right. We're, yeah. We're, we're, I, I'm like well, a non-chronological yeah. guy. Yeah. I'm, you know, when you're a bullshitter, <laughs> it, it just, <laughs> you just say it forth. as it comes, man. You, I mean, if <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what separates bullshitters from uh, uh, other people is BSers don't really care. <laughs> yeah, it's just like whatever comes to mind. And other people feel like, well, I got to tell this in a chronological way. So... You can go ahead with the chronology, Matthew. <laughs> no. Well, you passed on the two uh, bulls next to the road opening yeah. morning. Then you guys went off and did your phone call. Yeah. Uh, so you can talk about that. Now oh, yeah. So we're going over there, and I'm looking at my phone, reading notes, getting ready for the call. And all of a sudden, Michael slams on the brakes, and it's like expletives. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "What? I thought we got a flat tire or something. And he's rolling down his, or, or, or I don't know, are you rolling down your window? <laughs> no, I got in your I, door. You jumped out. No, I, I wasn't rolling him down. I hit the little lever that, you know, electrically oh, rolls down okay. your window. <laughs> there you go. And I'm like, what's going on? And I look out his window, and there is a lunker bull with two cows standing there in the frost. And Michael looks at me. I look at him. I'm like, Screw the phone call. <laughs> Go get those guys. I'll wait here. And then duty called and we drove off. Yeah. And then we saw another really big one, but he was so far out there, the heat waves, the the mirage was already hitting in the morning mm-hmm. that you really couldn't tell other than you just saw big paddles way, yeah. way out there. But it was hard to tell if he was on the right side of the creek or the wrong side of the creek Yeah, that is the unit boundary. I saw that one too, yeah. but we were uh, we were looking at it from a long ways away. Yep. Yeah. But there was like, there's a couple out there, but that one nice bull way out there. Yeah. But hey, he was even further than a mile from the road. So I, I'll yeah. be honest, I didn't inspect him that because I didn't try <laughs> that. <hard to. laughs> I, I kind of pretend like he wasn't there. Yeah. Well, I kind of pretended that he's on the other side of the creek. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then we came back from our call. And that's where you guys took over. I had no idea. I, I mean, I was just, I'm following. Well, I was looking at you guys from where we were where we were parked at, and I, I, for the longest time, I couldn't see you guys, so I thought you guys went on a stock, but then eventually I saw you guys were just 20 yards to the right, so I knew you guys were doing something over there. Had some little scheme going on. <laughs> yeah, and we show up, there's like $40,000 worth of cameras and spotting scopes and tripods all directed in one little location, and Michael and I agree, something's going on, and... We had a game plan for the rest of the day. We were like, we're right. going up this knob. Yeah. We're going to see all the the territory we're in. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And then, <laughs> well, I'm yeah. glad we came back and you guys had that bull yeah. spotted. But. We just, you know, had, we saw where he bedded down. He wasn't visible by the time you guys got back. I know. That's why I thought you guys were making it up. And Marcus was like, you see those two spruce trees? Line it up with that big point m- mountain back there. I'm like... <laughs> It never happens that way. This is, <laughs> he's just making this up. Yeah. <clears throat> but then you showed me that footage and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And you, uh, 
Matthew never gets excited. But maybe you get excited and you just don't show it like I do. Yeah. But he was getting pretty excited. He's like, Dad, let's go. I'm like, <laughs> what is that? Why are you screwing around here? Like, yeah. And I'm like, get out well, there. my stomach's killing me. You're going to have to give me about five minutes here. And he's like, oh, great. <laughs> so when I come back, he's packed. He's loaded. He's ready yeah. to go. I'm like, hmm, if Matthew's ready to go, they must have seen something. Yeah. So. Well, we were watching. There was six moose over there. There was three, four bulls. Yeah. And two cows. Yeah. It was crazy. And then. The thing was, like, those two bulls, I think we decided that they were actually the same two that were next to the road, and they had just worked that way. Uh-huh. And when they stood next to that bull, the big one, it was just, like, unreal how much bigger he was than those two bulls. Yeah. It's like, it really put it in perspective, because you'd look, and you're like, man, those are pretty nice. And then the, the third one would come up, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, we need to go. We need to go back to that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus was uh, trying to convince me that we just needed to head out there ourselves. But <laughs> guys got that would have been fine with me. I, I would have just hung out and watched it all happen from a mile away. Mm-hmm. But I think what helped, it seems, is that cow had to have been in heat. Yeah, for sure. She he was definitely to. rutting. The big bull was following her. Yeah. Had his nose right up in there and was just, Yeah, I mean, he was definitely still rutting. Yeah, had to be. Yeah. I mean, she she looked like a younger cow. I wonder if she didn't get the first cycle in September and yeah, came into cycle again. But she had a lot of boyfriends. Yeah, yeah. There was, <laughs> every, yeah. every bull on that side of the marsh was strolling through there <laughs> or betting next to her. Yeah. yeah. So what happened then? Uh, we basically charged straight for it and then... When we got close, one of the smaller bulls saw us and watched us for a few minutes <laughs> as we just walked right towards them. Um, and then eventually, once we got close enough, a bunch of them stood up. And we st- at first, we didn't see the one that we were after, so we thought he might have run off or moved. Um, a lot can happen in the half hour that it takes to, or hour or however long it took us to walk out there. Um, so he could have moved, and then eventually he stood up and yeah. Well, we those two smaller him. bulls stood yeah. up first, and yeah. at first you're like, "Oh, is that him?" And you're like, "No, no, no. Like, <laughs> you'll know thing, when it's him." Good <laughs> thing Marcus was here. <laughs> Michael's back there yeah. yelling at us. Yeah. Moose, moose, moose. <laughs> We're like, "Yeah, yeah, we know." <laughs> yeah. Well, because you guys, well, because Marcus has the headphones on with your guys' lavalier mic, so he well and you obviously know what's going on better than I do because I'm behind you guys filming. I I see the one that you guys have seen for five minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, guys, Moose right here. He stands up. Then the other two stand up. And then I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Back here, like, because I stay, you know, 30 yards behind them just to get a different angle. And, yeah, it was crazy. I was, yeah. It was kind of like uh, – it reminded me of when uh, we were in Wyoming – when I saw the elk, 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 freaking, I always freak out when I see him. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of funny. And I was like, guys, you see, you see this moose right here? Yeah, we've been looking at it for five minutes. It's like, All right, well, I guess I'll just turn around and walk back to the truck. <laughs> well, that, that's a testament to how seriously you take your job, Michael. You, uh, you've got your eye in the viewfinder and you are filming. Yeah. So you don't have a Thank lot you. of peripheral vision when True. you have your eye in the viewfinder. That's right. So we're, we're going to cut you some slack right. on that. Okay. So Versus thanks. my camera angle, which is probably all over the place, <laughs> and I'm not looking through the viewfinder trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, the amazing part to me was that you guys had drawn that line of those two spruce trees, and Matthew walked in a straight line there, and that moose got up. We would have stepped on him if he wouldn't have got up when he did. He walking. was right on that line, wasn't exactly. he? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And didn't the cow stand up before he stood up? Yeah, because they were obscuring each other. Or, you know, they were. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Right, one. The cow was right in front of the bowl. Yeah. Because I, I remember, yeah. if I remember, I thought she stood up. I don't have to look at the footage. And I'm thinking, it was very close. I mean, yeah. they stood up. And right I'm thinking, next. well, he's gone. Because mm-hmm. here's that cow. Mm-hmm. Well, then within... A few seconds, all of a sudden, you see these big antlers <laughs> coming out of the willows behind her. I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <clears throat> and then he stood in front of a bush. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, for, yeah, there was the cow, cow for a while. <laughs> yep. No shot. For it was surprising. I mean, it probably. Yeah. I don't know how long that whole scenario was. It felt like forever. Mm-hmm. I yeah. bet it was probably only a twenty seconds. Yeah. Or so, right. But still, <laughs> they, they stood there felt and like five stared yeah. at us for a while. I was thinking in minutes, not seconds. Yeah. Well, yeah. I but, I think he was behind the cow for maybe twenty seconds, and then took a few steps to the side and was behind a bush for about a minute mm-hmm. and then yeah. eventually stepped out where yeah he could do something so huh well i was like oh please don't walk straight away that that was my worry that was yeah he could have they just... were both the cow and him were gonna walk straight away and you weren't gonna get a shot i mean they didn't seem super uh spooked by us so mm. it's possible we could have just chased after him 10 minutes later and but then, I mean, if they would have gotten to those thick yeah, willows, we wouldn't have, you're gonna seen have to ever. be yeah. 20 yards away before you're going to yeah. get a shot. And chase after them. Think about them with their eight foot legs strolling across yeah. the bog. Right. And, and us fighting and struggling. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean actually chase them down. I mean, give them right. a few minutes and then yeah. <laughs> sneak after them. It's yeah. not like antelope or anything where. They catch a sight of you 500 yards away and they scurry off. Right. These guys, I mean, they watched us walk up to them, you know, 100 yards away and didn't yeah. stand up until we. Although, when they do take <laughs> off, like, or I mean, start walking, they're actually covering a lot of ground. Right. Like, they make it look really easy, but they're just, yeah, you know, cover a mile in no time. <laughs> right. I wonder if, uh, because when we went in there, you kind of went a little bit right which would have taken us downwind. And I wonder if it's just because they couldn't smell us. Or, I'm or, sure that yeah. helped. And and their vision isn't that good, is it? I mean, everything I've ever seen of moose or heard about moose is their vision isn't their strong suit, their nose and their hearing. Well, and then and, they, I mean, they don't, obviously there's a lot less permits for them, so they don't have near the hunting pressure to that elk make deer, them yeah. as scared of humans. Yeah. But, yeah. There's a lot of factors at play. <laughs> because my sure. worry is people are going to see this footage. And because that young cow is, I, I don't know if she was like goofy, she wouldn't leave. And people are going to say, what do you guys do? Go to the zoo and shoot this thing? Or <laughs> I mean, after we shot, or after I shot the bull, uh, she stood around for five, ten minutes while he was laying there on the ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder if that's just because they're a big dominant animal and they're just not really scared of right well i've seen similar situations with mule deer too i think it's this all case you know case specific yeah well and uh, anytime animals are in that breeding mindset yeah Yeah, they definitely have highly compromised yep that's for sure and i i think that's what was going on there this cow she's like oh man finally and the bull is like, hey, man, it's going to be a long, cold winter. Eh? <laughs> Glad I found this one before the snow comes. And, you know, I mean, how many times in hunting has that situation, whether it's a bull elk or a mule deer buck or whatever, the doe stands there. And as a result, Spitzer's bad, buck. Yeah. <laughs> bad news for Mr. Antlers. Yeah. So. Oh, Were you excited at that shot? Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I was definitely excited. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Just, yeah. We got <laughs> real close. I mean, we, did we were yeah, the, really what, close. Did we ever range that? I never did. No. It we was so we didn't need to. 70 <laughs> yeah. yards. Yeah, maybe. 70, yeah. I was going to say 70, 60, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Close enough that I just had to yeah. hold right on and not worry about adjusting anything and And with that first shot that crack when it hit was so loud i'm like what'd you do hit him in the antler or what i've never heard a bone crack that loud (laughs) before but then when we did the autopsy and we saw where you hit him in that rib it took that whole rib out and the entrance wound was huge that had to been what that crack noise was or the shoulder blade shoulder blade and then the on the other side yeah yeah. Huh. Where'd he go? 20 yards when he laid down? I don't even know Not if he even. went 20 yards. Yeah. He might yeah. have I taken mean, four steps. After the first shot, he just stood there and shot again. Then yeah. he took a few steps and went down. Yeah. They're big, tough animals. That's yeah, for sure. Because yeah. <laughs> sure. that was a that was a 300 win mag. Shooting acubones, right? Yeah, 180 grain acubones. And uh, 
I don't know. You probably didn't need that Leupold VX6. <laughs> no. 3 to 18 scope at that range. No, I needed the <clears throat> fixed three power scope, I think. <laughs> but, uh, that's your favorite rifle, though, Matthew. Yeah, I like the 300 when mags. Yeah, I don't know why. They weigh a lot. <laughs> They're heavy to carry. <laughs> they kill stuff really dead, though. Yeah, that's, that's what I like about them. Yeah. So it's we the, we call that a how a handshake on our TV show. That's a how a model fifteen hundred. It's amazing how many people want to know what your setup is from the rifle to the scope to the ammo to the. So any more on when we do our YouTube stuff, I, I just ask you guys put it in there mm -hmm. uh, that way. And, but even then, some people ask. I know. It's, yeah. I, I was, <laughs> <laughs> you read the YouTube comments. It's like what rifle or what cartridge were you using? Uh, a 308 win uh, that big overlay we put across the screen we didn't put that there just as a promo item yeah <laughs> that, that's to tell you this is what we were using it makes you that's, feel really good when you spend like an hour and a half editing something like that and then people don't even <laughs> look at it <laughs> <laughs> what's well, funny too i don't know it's funny to me how how much people wonder about the actual caliber like, yeah and it's character. just like whatever you're comfortable with yeah like why like people overthink it yeah, for we, sure. But that's, I mean, I, well, I don't know. That's fine, I guess. But. You know that uh, we did that piece for Nosler called Selecting an Elk Cartridge. Mm -hmm. And that's getting almost 100,000 views on YouTube right now. But no matter what you do, someone's going to argue with you. Yeah. Well, oh, and yeah. then you didn't tell them, like, this is exactly what you need to use. You right. told them, use what works for you, what you're going to be yeah. accurate with. And people, <clears throat> people don't want ambiguous answers. They want you to say, use this <laughs> right. with this but, bullet yeah. and that. Only that. <laughs> but then when you give them a range of possibilities, then the, so they're mad because you didn't give them something precise. So you give them something precise, and then all the armchair experts are like, oh, no, you got to use this. If you don't use that. I mean, the number of people who tell me I'm a fool for using a 308 on elk is, it's a lot of people tell me that. And uh, then you get the stories of, oh, my grandpa shot a, bull elk in the head with the 222 and yeah it. <laughs> like yeah you get that stuff i mean some guy from alaska <laughs> oh no we just shoot him in the ear with this uh what, what did he tell me uh, 243 okay <laughs> imagine how many moose are running around in alaska with 243 bullets through their jaw or something <sighs> yeah, because they that's... shoot him in the ear anyhow so then the fun started. Yeah, you know, well, actually, I thought the Gutton and Gillen went way better than I thought it would based on that big willow clump he died on. Thoroughly, yeah. thoroughly impressed. No, that the the big bed sheet you brought with definitely came in clutch. That was yeah. that helped a lot too yeah, for did. the whole having somewhere to set the meat to keep it clean and yeah. work on it. It was a uh, interesting though because in the the swampy part, trying to find somewhere that was both not waterlogged and you know also not super dirty or in the shade or things was just hard Rare. to find yeah. <laughs> so we had meat bags scattered all over the place just yeah. trying to find somewhere that was suitable to let them sit while we were finishing up yeah well uh, imagine if that was an alaska yukon moose well even half again as big that's crazy mm -hmm. and when i was the last time that we shot any when i was up there one of them we tipped over in about a foot of water. You, you aren't going to drag that thing. No, even the, the water. one, even the one that the Shiras. You you can't once it's down. There's no moving it until it's in pieces. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it is where it is. You can kind of roll it over. That's about it. Yeah, my uh, my girlfriend tells the story. She spent a summer in Alaska, and apparently a moose died in one of the other research sites that was submerged in water and so they had to figure out how they were getting this, this moose out of three feet of water without disrupting the research site and also you know getting it out there in some reasonable fashion you aren't going to what they do i i can't remember what they wound up doing but huh just no, that's, yeah so that's why i'm looking at that thing laying there i'm like holy cow imagine if this thing was half again as big I, I would just walk back to the truck and say, you guys are on your own. <laughs> 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 but that that was fun. That was cool. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know. 
where else you can go and from one glassing spot count 20 20 some shiras moose in the morning no it's pretty pretty exceptional i mean i i've spent a lot of time down in that country and so I, I i know some other good moose spots as well but really? i think that's probably the yeah. best as good as it gets yeah so we uh we didn't go down there for the opener which was september 15th isn't that when moose season opens not in that spot but yeah. in surrounding spots in the unit we could yep, have been september there september 15th. 15th i think all the tags must have been filled because we didn't see another moose hunter that was also really nice yeah. <laughs> the fact yeah. that just some uh some people driving the road yeah kind of wildlife observing and couple i don't a couple of elk hunters yeah yeah i think like there were some elk hunters confused elk hunters or yeah just, uh, i'm not quite sure what they were doing driving that road on one side it's private on the other side it's you can't uh, close to elk hunting yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah what are you guys what, doing <laughs> i talked to like three people driving by when when i was going back and forth and they were all elk hunting. I was like, oh, well, have you, they, they all asked me, have you seen any elk? No, I don't know what you guys are doing back here, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, Montana is known for complex regulations. So eh. maybe they didn't, <clears throat> didn't read that part. But so <clears throat> gotten and gilling a moose. That's the first time we've gotten and gilled the moose on our TV show. And well, this is the first. This is season 10. I'm filming this stuff. Wow. And this is the first moose tag. Oh, let well, me yeah, state that. We went to Alaska on a moose hunt in 2012, and that was a train wreck of train wrecks. <laughs> that was, it, from the minute we landed in Fairbanks, I knew it was going to be a train wreck. <laughs> that's the one it, where they punctured your... Uh, no, that was a bear hunt, hunt where the oh. TSA put all the holes in my raft. No, this was... Broken down boat motors, uh, buying fuel way out in the bush that was mostly water and a little bit of fuel. So every night when it got down into the teens, you had to skim the ice off the fuel and you Jeez. didn't dare leave the fuel line uh, attached because it, it would freeze up. Every night the fuel line froze up because there's so much water in the fuel. And, and then you have these water, these separators where the fuel goes through and the water's supposed to come out. Huh. You would have to empty that a couple times a day as you're <laughs> running the river. Like, well, that's one way to get a little bit more out of your fuel is to water it down like that. <laughs> uh, rained on, on an 11 day hunt. I think it rained torrentially eight of those days. Uh, Jeez. Boat motor broke twice. Yeah. Did that one make TV? Oh, yeah. It did? I haven't seen it. If you go out on the YouTube channel, it's called uh, Alaska Moose Disaster or something (laughs) like that. It was... (laughs) It was everything that could go wrong. And then as a res- as a non-resident, you got to shoot something that's either 50 inches with four brow tines or with four brow tines. Uh, and so the locals don't have that requirement. It's any moose. So you drive up and down the river and there's all these moose carcasses laying on- along the river with these, you know, 30, 35, 40 inch bulls, which are good, young, nice eating bulls. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was... My buddy Jerry Pritchard was on that hunt. He missed his 25th wedding anniversary to be on that hunt, <laughs> and it was a wreck. I, Jerry, I owe you. I don't know how I'm going to make it up to Lisa, but... Uh, Sounds like we should do it again. Yeah. It couldn't be any worse, right? <laughs> <laughs> can only go up. Is that, can no, only is, get better is that the there. one where you had to crank the boat motor with your belt mm-hmm. or something? Yeah, I had to, I had to <laughs> grab a boot lace. <laughs> And then I still got a look at that scar on the back of my hand from where that thing. Yeah. And that that was one uh, on this podcast. People have heard me say, don't be handy. (laughs) So fortunately, my dad believed in buying used boat motors in northern Minnesota. So from a very young age, I thought as quick as you pushed away from the dock, the first thing you had to do, take the cowling off the motor and start cussing. (laughs) (laughs) Light a cigarette and drink a beer and wrench on the motor. And That's so I'm like, five, protocol. yeah, I'm like five <laughs> years old. I'm looking over his shoulder and he's always wrenching on a boat motor. <laughs> so the only part of my skill set where I have any handy mechanical aptitude is outdoor outboard motors. And I, so it's amazing how handy you become when it, you know, 
is kind of like life threatening. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> so the camera crew sees me pressed into action occasionally, and my wife is downstairs, so we got to kind of be silent on this part. She's not supposed to know I have any mechanical aptitude at all because she would have me here fixing things, and I don't want that. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> but yeah, that was the one, Matthew, where the boat motor. So it, it got to the point where on that hunt, we only dared drive the boat upriver. So you could float so back So we down. could float back down <laughs> if the motor broke yeah. down on us. And we would hear, we'd run into another hunter or something. He's like, boy, there's some big bulls way down around, blah, 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 whatever, where this d- creek dumps in. Well, I didn't dare go down there because I'm not going to be able to get back to camp if this boat motor craps yeah. on me. So. I was, I'm not going back moose hunting. No. Nope. What if you find someone that has a reliable boat to rent? You know what, you know what the offer is. I got an email from Jim. Ooh, that'd be fun. He wants to fly into his favorite spot. Well, let's do that. You said yes, right? (laughs) No, (laughs) I haven't. So those of you who who watched our, uh, maybe they haven't watched it, but our buddy Jim Bachedale from Thorn Bay, Alaska was down here and we went to Wyoming on an antelope hunt. And Michael laid down, Michael always says he's laying down some average footage. He he smiles like, yeah, I'm here to lay down average footage, man. <laughs> That's a lie. He, <laughs> well, he lays down He very laid good down footage. like <laughs> world-class footage on this hunt of Jim shooting an 85-inch pronghorn with his custom hawking. And if you want to see Jim in action, uh, go out to our YouTube channel and watch that. Or we did the, the two-part uh, Sitka blacktail hunt with him up in Alaska. Well, Jim has shot some whopper moose and he's got this spot he goes and he said, well, uh, no one else goes there because there's so many brown bears there that in September when the silvers are running, nobody wants to hunt there. So the moose are really big. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got, he's in kind of throwing little bits and pieces out there because he knows my aversion to going back to Alaska filming a moose hunt. The logistics of filming a moose hunt in Alaska are ridiculous if you do it self-guided. We don't have any way to charge. We have no way to manage media. You're going to ruin at least one camera because of the rain and the conditions. It just, all those problems let's do it let's do it that's what I'm saying. <laughs> we should do it <laughs> I, I, you're not deterring them <laughs> I know. there's a reason why most everybody who films these uh f- float type hunts goes with an outfitter when when they film them because the outfitter you just tell them look i need an extra boat i need all this blah 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 mm-hmm. well some people are smart like i think uh the meat eater crew they fly in, they use a 40 mile air out of toke. And if you fly in, you can just fly more gear in and you're at a stationary camp. So you're not floating, you're not doing any of that stuff. But if you shoot one, you got to get that damn thing to the landing strip. Mm-hmm. So that's a trade off that I'm not sure I'm excited about either. But anyhow, to, to do what Jim wants to do, we'd take an otter into this lake. And otters can hold a lot, right? Yeah. So we could actually bring. We'd have to bring a generator. A, we'd or something. have to bring a whole armada of rafts mm-hmm. to float all of our stuff down. Mm. And then, if we shoot one or two moose, we need spare rafts to float. I mean, we we might not be able to get in there in an otter with all the gear we'd have to bring. Mm. And then, when they come to pick us up, they got a couple big moose and meat and everything else. I think it's well, feasible. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we got some logistics to work on. but yeah. uh, And then in Alaska, all those logistics cost a lot of money. So the last time we went to Alaska, our production costs, film permit, everything else, gear, rentals, everything was a $25,000 bill to produce all that. It's a great investment. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you just don't have great luck in Alaska. I mean, well before the show started, you were up on a moose hunt there over 9-11. Yeah, yeah. When 9-11 Ooh. happened, we were in moose camp, and we didn't even know what happened until we came out of the bush until, I yeah. think, the 18th of September is when we found out. And then oh. you tried to fly back with a rifle a week after 9-11 yeah. happened. 
in my sure favorite, that one in my well. favorite hunting knife I had in my check bag. That didn't go over very well. Mm. But I went into the Fairbanks airport and got dropped off. And there were just hunters sleeping everywhere in the airport. Oh, geez. Because you know what happened to air service at that yeah. point. It was shut down. So everybody's, they could have sold your seat on a flight back home for a lot of money. Because mm. there were guys who'd been there longer than I was. Dang. And uh, it was chaos. But and just what it was. But we shot four moose on that trip. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, four <laughs> Alaska moose. It was me and, and this is where... You know, having family that lives up there, my grandparents lived in Haines, Alaska until they died. And then I've got three uncles and their families who live up there and tons of cousins. So I, back before the TV show, I'd just show up in Fairbanks. And if I would buy beer and toilet paper, that was my cost of the trip. It's a good deal. Which with those guys being, uh, having to buy beer and toilet paper was a significant <laughs> expense. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, it's probably like a hundred bucks for yeah. that. <laughs> but like most Alaskans, Alaskans get serious about this stuff because in Alaska, you don't go on a moose hunt and just go outside of town like we do here in the lower 48. Every hunt in Alaska, even if you're a resident, is serious logistics. So... My family has a 24-foot cargo boat that they leave up there. They dump it on the Tananan River and go down to the Yukon River in it. And I don't know how many thousands of pounds of gear they put in that 24-foot cargo boat. <laughs> it's got twin engines on it. And then they've got two or three little John boats with jet drives and a scanoo. I mean, I mean... You, there's no way I could do that on the TV show and convince people, oh, yeah, you could do this also. So right. that's why I don't go back up there. They invite us every year. Um, but also their behavior is not conducive to being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we would have to put it on some other channel. To go hand in hand with the amount of beer that you had to purchase. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't drink. So, you know, th this is the part in my family. They think if you tell the same story three times in one night, but you tell it louder each time as you've had more beer, that it, they think it's a different story. <laughs> but when you're sober, it's just annoying as hell. Oh, yeah. Huh. So, anyhow, how did we get on that? Subject. Talking about Alaska. Oh, oh yeah. So I, I guess maybe we should ask the listeners to weigh in on whether or not they want us to go to Alaska next September. You know, everybody's going to say yes. I think we should. You know, you're the only one who has to deal with the logistics and the cost of doing this. I know. So that's uh, so not, I, you're not going to convince very many people that you shouldn't do it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's always easier to spend the other guy's money and incur the other guy's time or uh, spend the other guy's time. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> however that's miserable true. you guys have been on any hunt, if we go to Alaska and it rains for 10 days in a row, that misery that you've had on some of these hunts is just a small fraction of the misery it would be stuck in a tent up there with brown bears walking around, eating salmon, waiting for you to shoot a moose they can steal from you. Let's do it. I'll work <laughs> on the camera logistics. All right. Are you going to get some waterproof cameras? Is well, that the deal? If you're paying for them. We got some good rain covers, but then the charging and the media and all that we'll yeah how are we going to charge batteries well we've we've kind of been working on different ways to do that the new camera is a lot more challenging mm -hmm. the old cameras is a lot easier to deal with yeah a lot more feasible so because they don't they just don't use near the energy or right. media storage <laughs> right so but, either we bring a ton of batteries which you can't put the lithium those big lithium ion batteries we use in the cameras we can't put those in check bags we got to carry them on mm -hmm. we're gonna carry have to a hundred pounds of lithium ion yeah. batteries onto the airplane yeah that wouldn't gonna, flag security i'm gonna all, figure out it? that solar situation <laughs> well but if it <laughs> does gonna, does solar work when it the cloud yeah, yeah, true. Is that like, that's true. Sun. At we're still gonna feet? need yeah and it gets it gets your your hours of light and darkness are not what they normally are in the summer in alaska so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of voting we do a, yeah. let's, let's do a out. caribou hunt rather than that, a moose. That sounds Ooh, that'd good be too. fun. I, I'm way more into the caribou hunt than I am the 
the moose hunt. All right. Well, Jim hunts caribou too a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, he hunts everything. Yeah. Perks of yeah. being an Alaskan resident. Yeah, kind of. But he lives so far out and on an island, he could just well be a non-resident as far as the logistics he incurs to get anywhere. But, <sighs> but so. I think I think it's a when there are those logistical challenges, it makes mm-hmm. for an interesting story. And we're going to be Does documenting it? that story the whole time too. Spoken like the true camera guy. <sighs> yeah. Right. So we're going to document for the, so if we do it. We're going to have all of our packing while we're here in the lower 48 because we got to show them how to get enough gear to Alaska. Yeah. How we're going to survive and not die up there, which we won't die, but I, I, I mean, there's an awful lot of equipment details that go into it. The logistics of getting everything to Alaska. So we can't count on Jim for everything. Because it's not like the viewer has a Jim Bachetail to say, oh, yeah, I'll bring this, I'll meet you there, I'll do this, I'll do that. Yeah, no, we want to show people how they could do it. That's the whole yeah. whole point, right? <sighs> oh, man. I'm getting talked into something. In my <laughs> right you know, you might, you might want to change your shirt at some point. You've got some moose blood on your right sleeve. No, I don't. This is a new shirt. That's a booger. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's what, what is it? It's not. It's not dried blood, is it? No, I don't That's know. not. But what's this? I have no idea. What's what? what? <laughs> I don't have no idea what that is. <laughs> it's, it's, Wiping snot on there. Yeah, I disagree. I just took it out of the dryer. <laughs> well, now it's dried on. <laughs> huh. Well, we're on a podcast. Nobody can see it. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, we're filming this one. Okay. So, what? What? Now that we've decided that we're not going to Alaska moose hunting, <laughs> what's next on the schedule? We're going to the Kaibab. Yeah, uh, deer hunting next week. Us Excellent. and Wade. Yep. Wade's our lingo, our buddy in Arizona. I'm excited. Are you? Yeah, I've not. I mean. We're going to see giant mule deer, right? They're just going to be running all over the place. That's what oh, I hear. Gonna, there's going to be like 200-inch mule deer just behind, crawling. Yeah, all behind over every the, bush, I'm yeah, sure. All right, cool. Yeah. That's what I thought. If we see a buck <laughs> over 150, I'm shooting it. All right. <laughs> and Wade said uh, if it's the last day, he's shooting anything with an antler. Heck, yeah. Because That's Wade doesn't too. screw around. When it comes to putting meat in the freezer, Wade is your guy. All right. He, Either way, but... In theory, there could be some really large mule deer bucks down there, right? In theory. In theory. We've heard that about all the places we hunt. Oh, yeah, there's a big one here, big one. Just like our Arizona elk hunt this year. If I would have listened to all the reports, I would have thought, you know what? If I leave there with anything short of a 360-inch bull, I've wasted this tag. (laughs) And I was so happy to shoot a 300-inch bull. I, I don't even think it's 300. Yeah, it, was no, a, it was a nice six point. Yeah. But I that thought was, that was really an accomplishment. That was that the night. biggest one we saw. We only yeah. saw three, I think. Or was right. It? <laughs> yeah. In two days of scouting and two days of hunting in the rut, you would swear that, oh boy, this is going to be a slam dunk. So when people tell me about this whole kaibab thing of, oh my, don't worry, you're going to see 30 bucks a day. I'll believe it when we see 30 bucks a day. But we won't have any cell coverage. We won't have any anything, which is great. Yeah. I, 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 I love places where we don't have any connection to the rest of the world. A lot less distractions. Keep you Zero. focused on the task at hand. Do you guys get tired of all the distractions I have? Is it disruptive to the producing? Mm. I mean, you got to do it to pay the bills, so... I mean, well, I understand. The, and the con- I mean, yeah, the conference calls and all that, it definitely makes a difference. Yeah. They don't okay. they don't really think those times through. I blame it on the organizations that, <laughs> that, that, that make you go on that, these. That was nice of you to say that, Michael. Organizations. He's referring to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I sit on the board of the Elk Foundation, and I end up with one or two hour-long conference calls a week. And they're usually at 9 in the morning. It's like... Whoever is, when I chair the committee, our calls are always at two in the afternoon because 
I'm going to be taking a nap at that time of day. I'm not, it's not like I'm going <laughs> to force somebody to miss prime morning hunting or prime evening hunting. So, well, no, but most, most of the rest of the board doesn't run a hunting TV show. So they're, that, they're not out hunting a hundred days a year. They're way smarter than I am. That's well, why. Well, and then one thing about not having cell service too, is just, you're not, you're just more immersed into the, landscape right. you yeah know, like to constantly be drawn away to this alternate reality that is your phone you know mm-hmm. you're like on social media or whatever you're like having that completely gone and just right. being able to be yeah. fully immersed in right. you know nature and into the hunt that's it's a different experience it's a totally different experience in right. my opinion oh i i hate that phone but mm-hmm. Hey, but it's, it's e- attached to your face. I know. <laughs> Pretty much. Because if I don't do the CPA work, you guys don't have a job. Yeah. Because <laughs> this operation doesn't make any money. <laughs> so I got to take some of those CPA phone calls and then all the volunteer stuff and mm-hmm. then trying to keep this thing moving. I think I need someone just to handle the phone while we're out there. There you go. Hire a, an assistant, not a production assistant, just a... An assistant. An, an administrative assistant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> administrative because assistant. the moose hunt was a perfect example. A nine o'clock call, I end up being disrupted from a perfect time. Um, imagine if that moose would have walked into the depths of never seen again. Mm-hmm. And I was there on a conference call screwing us up. That wouldn't have been good. Well, I'm glad we're not going to have that issue in Arizona. No. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thinking that. That might go into our application strategy. I think gohunt.com should have, you can sort, because they have the filter where you can do it by public land and private land, trophy quality, draw odds. One of their sorts should be bad cell coverage. Yeah, yeah, that and Onyx Maps, they could have a, just like the roadless area. Right. I mean, that probably goes hand in hand, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. bet if you follow the roadless area, there's probably crappy a lot less. cell service. <laughs> the crappy cell service layer. Like, that, where will I not have cell service? We need, uh, we might have a new layer for them <laughs> and for the Go Hunt guys. You need to filter this by terrible cell service because I think all things being equal, I'd rather hunt in an area where there's no cell service. Yeah, I mean, it's nice for the safety aspect, but I just don't. But we got. I, I, I don't. I don't. I personally, it's hard to turn turn it off when it's there. But how are you going to uh, post your Instagram stories if there's no <laughs> cell not, coverage? I don't know how to do Instagram stories. These guys do all my Instagram stories for me. I don't know. I've been how trying to do that. real hard to teach them, but. I'm not teachable, doesn't Michael. Seem, doesn't seem like it's. I don't believe so well. you. I think you. I think you got to figure it out. You're just. You're just, <laughs> you're, you're just disguising it just, like your handiness. Yeah. No, I, I really don't. You hear me over there cussing? <laughs> it's usually I'm trying to figure something out on Instagram. Because I, I have a that social media person, Michelle, bless her heart, says, "Oh, you got to do this. You got to do that." So I try to do it out in the field, and it's absolutely a train wreck. <laughs> I would. I would rather still be packing moose than to have to screw with my Instagram account when I'm but out there. But then you like very you you understand tax code and all that stuff very deeply, but then you can't figure out the like very intuitive Instagram menu. Instagram is about <laughs> that. <laughs> nah, Instagram is so counterintuitive. I don't know how anyone figures it out. And then I see guys using their finger and they write stuff on the picture and, and things. My, my buddy Brian Call at the Gritty Bowman. Yeah. He's doing all that stuff. I'm like, Brian, what are you doing? And he knows what a Luddite I am when it comes to technology. <laughs> he BSs me with some sort. Well, you got to have this app and you got to know, and, and you got to buy a special phone. And he's got, he's leading me along like, man, really? I, I got to buy a different phone? And then he starts laughing. He's like, no, you just need to know how to use Instagram. Well, <laughs> there's a problem. I was about ready to go spend $1,000 on a phone that would help me <laughs> type my, my digits or my letters on Instagram. But, oh, well. <laughs> so what else we got going on? We, we are going, we're, we're doing a cool project in November. We are doing a desert bighorn sheep hunt. Yeah. And that gets, that's going to be cool because of all the conservation issues involved. Yeah. I'm excited. The, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting. I got to do some research to kind of figure out more yeah. what's going on. down. There. <clears throat> yeah. We got to get that dialed in. We've been on the road so much. We got to line up all those people we're going to talk to. Mm-hmm. But the interesting part about sheep and, 
a little bit of what this story is going to be about is I call them sheep volunteers, but some people call them sheep nuts, sheep whatever. You got to be careful when you sheep say nuts. things yeah, like sheep nuts. I don't know about nuts. that they, one. They think, <laughs> they think that you're going to be eating something, <laughs> Rocky Mountain oysters. But how often do hunters get criticized for, oh, you only do conservation when it's something you want to shoot or something you want to hunt? Well, what are the odds of drawing a sheep tag? Very low in almost every scenario. Every state I can think of. How many years have you applied for sheep in Montana? 17. 16. 16 17. or 17. Marcus? Same. Same. Yeah. Michael, you, you just moved here. I've done 27 years. So between us, we've got, let's say, 33, 27. We've got 60 years of applying for sheep, and none of us have ever drawn so and that's common i mean right that, among, that, it's yeah. very I mean, low that, odds right with the exception of the unlimited areas but then you have very low opportunity yeah, yeah. terrible bad opportunity yep. and you can get weathered out and everything else but so the, the whole idea is in nevada it's a classic example when i went to college there in the late 80s i think they had three or four thousand desert sheep now they're over twelve thousand Wow. So why do these crazy volunteers spend their time, their money, uh, every do all this advocacy work on a, on behalf of a species where they're never the likelihood is they're never going to get to hunt it. Yeah. It, it, it causes the the question well, to it, be asked. What what causes hunters to do that? And I'm sure it's different for every hunter, but I think one of the cool things about sheep to me is that they just live in really cool places. Mm -hmm. They, they look really cool. And then, but mostly just the adventure involved with them. I mean, I've done a whole bunch of stuff. I worked on a research project on bighorn sheep and I've just filmed them for fun. And just like going into those places that they live is, I don't know. Is this something special about it? It's right. totally <clears throat> they use the landscape differently than any other species that, you know, mountain goats, I guess somewhat similar, but they're just yeah. badass critters. Right. And that's, I don't know if that's <laughs> the allure of why, you know, organizations like wild sheep foundation have so much support with their volunteers, but I'm sure that's a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I guess the allure of, Oh, maybe I'll get a hunt one someday. Is, is a big part of it too, but yeah, I don't know. But I, if, if you're realistic, you say, you know what, I'm probably never going to tangibly participate in a hunt of my own that's the result of this time and money I'm putting into this. And to me, that is the real example of a conservationist. And I don't think the sheep guys give themselves enough credit for how... Uh, how passionate they are about a cause that is selfless. There's no self, very, very little self-interest at all. And hunters get accused of, oh, well, you only do that because you want to shoot them, you want to hunt them. Well, the, the whole sheep advocacy thing dispels that myth. Mm -hmm. Plus, you better, get, well, you better get schooled up on the whole wild horse issue. Yeah, I'll have to figure that out. I've been reading about that. And yeah, I read a pretty interesting article last night about it. Because but. that's a that's a competitive factor. Cheat grass, pinion juniper encroachment. Although the thing about wild sheep too that's interesting is there are so there is quite a few uh, very rich individuals, which is a different kind of a different take. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of volunteers that are on the ground doing stuff and. Like you're saying, it's like this selfless interest, but then it is weird because it does attract a very right. probably the highest dollar, highest right. paying clients, and I, I don't know. Well, That's just an interesting <laughs> thing to talk about because those mm -hmm. guys do contribute a lot monetarily right. towards the cause, no, they and do. they're the ones who actually a lot of times get to go hunt the sheep because right. they no, can I, afford it. But <clears throat> right, and that I mean, what we're going to be focusing on are these volunteer people yeah, no, of yeah. Wild Sheep, the Fraternity of Desert Bighorn, Nevada Bighorn Unlimited, those kind of groups. Yeah, I just didn't uh, want to ignore the the fact that those really, I mean, that is a very significant part of these 
cheap organizations. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. there is a funding mechanism that comes from those people with big checkbooks. But yeah. I bet you if you went to every state and said, does your sheep program pay for itself? I bet you the answer is no in every one of those states. You, and you, you mean in terms of the state wildlife the, agencies? Right. Yeah. You can't issue enough opportunity, enough permits to fund the cost no, yeah. of managing the sheep. So in effect, the guy who buys the deer tag and the antelope tag and the upland bird license and everything else, in effect, he or she is also funding programs like sheep programs and mm-hmm. goat programs and moose programs that are... And non-game programs and too, non-game. if you yeah, want to add that. Exactly. Into I mean, as narrow of opportunity as exists for moose, goat, and sheep... Some could argue they're a non-game species. <laughs> just about, yeah. Just, I just mean. because of how few opportunities exist. But. <clears throat> so what else you guys want to talk about today? Because I've, I've got my list here, and I've got all these books sitting out here. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to mention is all the data that we collected from my moose. Oh, that's a good, that's uh, a really good point, Matthew. What all? So in, in the mail, we were sent this packet of a variety of sampling tools and instructions and data that the fish, wildlife and parks wanted um, to judge either disease or health or a variety of other things about the moose. And so what all did we have to collect? We had a meat sample, had to check the liver for anything strange, check the ears for necrosis, measure the outside spread of the antlers, check the fat, check the the fat, Collect a tooth, yeah, or both teeth as we did, yeah. Um, is that it? I think that was. Most was there of a it, blood but... sample? No, there was no, no blood no. sample. When when I first saw the vial, I thought it was a blood sample, but that was just the meat sample. <laughs> um, oh, and then information about rutting behavior. Oh right, yeah, so. yeah, and so that that was a that came in a big vanilla envelope. Yeah. See, I say vanilla. And, and where I grew up, they call them vanilla envelopes. And so <laughs> I grew up my whole life calling manila envelopes vanilla envelopes out of a joke. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in the CPA world, when the first time you tell your secretary, can you get me a vanilla envelope? They look at you like, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> when really, I just grew up. My family never call. It's like Archie Bunker. No one ever calls anything by its true name or title. <laughs> And so, sorry, folks, if ever you hear Randy use a term that is not right, but sounds similar, it's something I grew up with. I'm not that ignorant. I do know the difference between a vanilla envelope and a manila envelope. (laughs) Anyhow, that was a pretty big manila envelope they sent you full of stuff. Well, and that's because, uh, I mean, FWP and researchers are concerned about moose in Montana. Well, not just Montana, but... Throughout the... I mean, yes, there's a lot of... A lot of stuff going on that's affecting them, and they're just trying to figure it out. I right. And I think it's, yeah, it's pretty cool that hunters are able to help. You know, the fact that FWP is still allowing opportunity to harvest moose, but then also utilize that opportunity to collect data and try to figure out more what's going on. It's, yeah. it's pretty awesome. Yeah, right here on the cover of this magazine right here, at Google Magazine, it says hunting is conservation. And I think using hunters to collect that kind of data is probably as as uh close or as as dead center on target of hunting as a conservation tool as, as anything that and I, excise taxes and license dollars but yeah well yeah the funding <laughs> mechanism is certainly hunting as conservation but i mean part of it's just getting as much as you can out of the animal too like a lot of this is stuff that they can't collect while the animal's still alive. Right. And yep. so the everything that they needed did not impede on our ability to get what we all the meat and everything off of the moose. And so it's valuable for us and it's valuable for them. So it's Yeah. You know. Can you imagine if they tried to collect some of that when they're alive? <laughs> Let's, let's go, let's go, go dart poke a moose, moose in a rump. Let, yeah, let's let's dart him and let's pull one of his teeth. Can you imagine if the moose, if you woke up and some dude had pulled your bottom two teeth? It's like, dang, I'm going to starve to death out here, man. Somebody <laughs> chasing moose around with a toothpick trying yeah, to like figure out how much fat there is in their butt. Yeah, that was interesting. I, I'd never seen that. Those guys do have some interesting stories. I've listened to some talks on... Uh, 
yeah. those people doing the research, and yeah, they do have some interesting moose darting stories. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's a little easier to uh, sample them when it's uh, a lethal scenario, yeah, as in a hunting situation. <laughs> right. No, there's no way I'd be out there with a big bull moose, half groggy, not knowing when he's going to get up and thump me. <laughs> Uh, you did have to sacrifice what a pea-sized chunk of meat. Yeah, out of uh, how much, how many pounds of meat? Yeah, <laughs> I wonder how much okay. meat is there. It's cooling know. right now on the concrete floor of the shop. Nice. So I have no idea how much meat is there. Uh, we're, I'm uh, guessing between, th- I mean, a boneless meat between yeah. three and four hundred pounds. That's what I was thinking. Three fifty, three six. So I don't Definitely. know. That's total ballpark. I'm yeah, just guessing. I was thinking there was six loads of boneless meat. Uh, average 60 to 70 pounds per load was my thought. Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of, I mean, a nice bull elk is what you get, like, Mm 220-ish of boneless meat somewhere in the, I mean, it all depends, but. Right. And it was a lot bigger than a. Oh, yeah. In a big bull elk. (laughs) (laughs) That's Uh, always a good reminder of, like, whoa, these animals are huge. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing it was in the high 300s. Really? Yeah. That's that's my thought. I'm with you. I'm thinking it's that. And we're going to be eating moose tenderloins. What what part of you, the meat do you guys want? I'm giving away That's Matthew. That's up to you. I'm giving away you don't need to give us meat. anything, but... Michael's over there. He's, he's <laughs> contemplating. Thinking. He's like, well, let me see. I got three roommates. You he know, is, if, you, if you tell your roommates to come over here and help us with this meat cutting party... They've yeah. already been asking me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? Like, yeah. Wow. It's like, well, when are we going to eat some moose? Yeah, like, wh- where were they when it came time to pack yeah, this thing that's out, right? right? That's right. Uh-huh. <laughs> one guy's got a broken arm, and he's still got a... You want your uh, he, got, he finally got his cast off. Uh-huh. He got Just he had in time surgery. for hunting yep. season. Yep. <laughs> so, Imagine that. Yep, but they... Well, he, he specifically asked me last night right when I got back. Where's the moose meat? <laughs> like, dude, you got to wait a little bit, man. <laughs> All right, here's what we should do. We should take one of those big bags of a front quarter, and you just bring it home and say, here you go. Yeah, you here take care is, of this. Man. Here you go, man. <laughs> what would he say? Uh, I don't know. He, I, he's pretty ambitious. He'd be probably like, oh, I can I can do this. Okay. But I don't know. I, huh. I wouldn't know what to do with it. I'm looking forward to learning how to you know, do all this processing stuff because it's pretty new to me. Yeah. Huh. Well, you guys already tried to give me the tongue in the shanks. Well, right? your yeah. tongue fell out of the, <laughs> yeah. the tongue that <laughs> fell out of the bag and got stepped well, gotta, on and rolled in the boil, dirt. You got to boil the crap out of it anyway. So that yeah. tongue, I've, guys, I've stepped on it twice now. All right, it, <laughs> fell, it, it, it fell out of the back of the truck onto the gravel road. So much for proper meat care. I know. <laughs> well, we didn't put it in a bag, so it, it we've just kind of tucked it in places, and you grab something, and all of a sudden, oh, what was that that fell out in the dark? You well, looked you down there. Gotta, Here's a tongue about four feet long <laughs> laying there on the ground. <laughs> you got to skin it anyway, right? And yeah. No, I don't know. We'll but see. But the heart the is out there. The heart is That's gonna a big get, heart. The heart oh. is going to get eaten el pronto. Cool. I eat elk heart, deer heart. Antelope heart, anything that's heart is mm-hmm. primo. Did you want to eat any tenderloin? Yeah. Yeah. You is that really, really a question? <laughs> 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 uh, well, <clears throat> look at all these books we got there. Michael picked up on the fly fishing book right away. Yeah. It's, I mean, I like to read a lot. I'm not very good at it. Picture books are helpful for me. <laughs> That's what um, I was going to say. But <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you the last time I read a book front to cut or front to back, but I need to start doing it. Huh. Well, that pile well, over there is the Jim Posowitz pile. Yeah, You're Beyond Fair Chase. Marcus. Everybody who takes Hunter Ed in Montana gets that book. Yeah. Which one? The, the little one there. It's called Beyond Fair Chase. It's like, I think there's been over a million copies printed. Really? Uh, Jim Posowitz wrote that. Uh, he is the founder of Orion, the Hunters Institute. And I served on Jim's board from 95 until 2010. And uh, he's written some amazing stuff for conservation. And after Beyond Fair Chase, I can't remember which of the next two books uh, of which one came first, whether it was Inherit the Hunt or Rifle in Hand. Uh, but those are just, if you're interested in hunting history and conservation history, Jim 
of all the living people I know of, there's no student of conservation history that has been a more prolific writer about it than Jim has. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Jim's fighting some health issues right now. Uh, we, we need to get him back on the podcast. He is on the podcast in 2015, and he's uh, just a great guy. But if you are interested in books that have some cool hunting stories, there's three of them by Posowitz, <coughs> uh, Inherit the Hunt, Rifle in Hand, and Beyond Fair Chase. Um, the other one that's there, Jim just wrote one chapter in that book, and it's the Bob Marshall uh, the story of the Bob Marshall country of Montana. And there's a, a chapter in there called, I think it's shoulder to the wheel. And it's Jim's version about a guy named Cecil Garland, who single handedly Cecil lived in, in Lincoln, Montana. And the, the, it's, uh, the country North of there, we call it the scapegoat wilderness. Now it used, Cecil called it the, the Lincoln back country. And it took him 10 years, but Cecil fought and fought and fought against that country being eroded and developed. And he convinced the Montana delegation to introduce a bill in Congress to make it a designated wilderness area. But it cost him his marriage, it cost him his business, it cost him everything. And his daughter, Becky, was a, is a client of our CPA firm. And I've asked Becky, I'm like, why would your dad go through all of that for land that he's never going to own. And she said, well, for him, it was pretty simple. It wasn't about him owning something. It was about us kids. I think there are three daughters. It, it was about his kids having a special place and grandkids and so on. And so it's a really remarkable story about what one person endured just to make uh, conservation happen on a large landscape. Uh, basis. So yeah, I think, cool. is it Rick Gretz? <coughs> yeah, yep. Rick Gretz. That's my kind of uh, book. It has pictures in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's beautiful nice. pictures yeah. in there, Michael. So maybe maybe there's a, a picture version for you. In there. Yeah. But that, yeah. that's one that I don't know how many times I've read it. Uh, it's a story I love to tell because it explains how conservation is never easy. It's never convenient. And it's always uncomfortable. I mean, Cecil, he he became such an uh, a villain in his little hometown. He owned a, a hardware and dry goods store called Garland's Town and Country. That the locals there were who were all excited about having all this development go on back there on those public lands. They were thinking jobs and this. Well, they boycotted Cecil's store. And a lot of the hunters in Montana would actually go to Cecil's store in Christmas season. They called it a shop-in. They would drive all the way to Lincoln, Montana to do as much of their Christmas shopping as possible in Cecil's little store to try support him because they knew that the some of the locals were, were not very happy with Cecil's efforts. Uh, eventually, he ended up getting divorced and moved to Utah. And he didn't get to see the Lincoln backcountry again until I think one, two years before he died. Uh, Becky, his daughter, brought him up and they flew over it. Uh, and he got to see it as it kind of conserved the way that, that he'd fought so hard for it. It's, it's the first citizens, uh, citizen originated wilderness area in the entire country. And if you go to the scapegoat, you quickly realize that the land is king. It, the scapegoat is not an easy place. And I mean, you think about the fact that it's so wild. We have a September 15th rifle elk season. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why can we do that? Because you, the, the faint hearted are not going to, uh, yeah, and Michael's looking at a picture. There you go. Uh, the, the scapegoat and the bob are not places for the faint-hearted. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. So that the, it's just books that have those kind of stories that attract me because I'm at that point where I'm interested in how did all this happen? How do these pieces of of country and land get conserved? Um, Is there a book on uh, that dam that was never built? No. In, no. No, you've heard us tell that yeah, story, that, that's Michael. A... And actually, Jim Posowitz, the guy who wrote these books, he's uh, uh, he's the guy who pretty much led the charge to keep that dam from being built 
on the Yellowstone River south of, of Livingston. And any of you who traveled to Montana who've ever went to Yellowstone Park on the north entrance, you've went from Livingston to Gardner, Montana. If you can imagine that road and that valley being flooded as a reservoir, that's just, imp- your mind can't go there. Yeah. But Paz paid a pretty heavy professional price for leading the charge on that. Uh, we were lucky he was within the wildlife agency at the time when the the powers to be thought it was such a great idea to damn that. And he led the local community pretty much in a revolt. <laughs> and, yeah. and somehow he convinced Life magazine to come out and do a full page, I mean, like multiple page center spread article on this effort to keep the Yellowstone as the longest undammed river in, in the United States. And Do you have that article? I don't. We need some, to find it. We yeah. got to go to Life Magazine, whatever year that was, Pause can tell me, I think it was 1972 or 73, uh, and get that article. Yeah, I wouldn't somehow. doubt they have an archive somewhere. Yeah. That, he said that's what turned the tide. He that's said, a remarkable us, story that I, is amazing that I've never heard before you told it to me. Yeah. And living in Bozeman, you think that that Every, would be a common story that people would know? Right. And uh, But if uh, you go talk to some of the locals in the Livingston area uh, who were there when, when Jim mm-hmm. was leading that charge, and him and his crew, he, uh, he was in charge of a division at FWP that got dismantled after that. Because That's of crazy. that, the politicians dismantled that part of FWP. and uh, But a lot of locals... Still to this day, even though they're all pretty old, if you talk to them, they talk about Jim in this reverent tone of, you know what, we'd have a freaking dam up there if it wasn't for him and his crew. And and Jim, he always deflects it like, oh, I didn't do it. I was just doing my job. And, <laughs> you know, I had all these people who worked under me. They did this great work and that great work. And Jim never wants to take credit for it. But any of you who fish the Yellowstone River or ever come to Montana, Try to put your mind around the fact that that would have all been a reservoir. Yeah. It would have not only messed up all the native fishing, it would have messed up migration corridors, it would have messed up all this wildlife habitat. So he's, uh, I would say, pauses my, uh, my mentor as far as how to raise hell uh, in the hunting <laughs> nice. and public land and conservation world. And uh, so those kind of stories, somehow we got to do that. Let's we got to figure out how we talk about the dam that never was. How do, how do mm-hmm. we get that story told? And the scapegoat. Both the of those scapegoat. are awesome stories. Yeah, I think, Matthew, on that behind you there, see where, where it says YouTube videos? It says on the whiteboard. Oh, uh, uh, yep. I think I have the Yellowstone Dam and the Cecil Garland story. Mm. They're on the whiteboard. I think it'd be interesting to do them alongside hunts. Really? In the, so, so involving be, those areas. So we should go hunt the scapegoat. You yeah. think the Forest Service would give us a film permit? If we, we have to, you got to really portray it in a way that's yeah. positive. I mean, I think it'd be positive to the message of federal lands. For so sure. they should be in support of it. Yeah. And We're pretty uh, non-invasive in our approach we for are. filming. Yeah, we've, we've received wilderness film permits in two areas this year. Three. The moose hunt. Yeah. Here in Montana, uh, the Arizona elk hunt and the New Mexico elk hunt. Cool. This is the first time we've ever had something like that. Every once in a while, we'll get one a year. This year, we've got three wilderness area film permits. So I appreciate the, the agencies listening to our story. Yeah. You, you got to really plead your case hard mm-hmm. in order to do it. But so the other books here. Uh, for me, and I've talked about some of these other ones. This is probably my favorite one about the history of conservation in North America or in the United States is by Michael Punky. Uh, it's The Last Stand. You guys have, the reason I talk about it so much is I've yet to have a book that, and you'll see there's a lot of pages marked here. Uh, I've never read a book yet that gives as much context to what people went through to create the conservation ethic in the United States. And this is mostly about George Bird Grinnell. Everybody likes to think about Roosevelt and a few others. And 
and they deserve credit also. But Grinnell was sort of the, the mind behind it all. Roosevelt had the power of the presidency and the, and the, the big bully pulpit. Uh, but yeah, nope, the last stand. And it, I think Punky does a really good job of explaining that we really owe our conservation ethic to the plight of bison. Bison yeah. are the species that paid the price to, it, they're the example of why America now has and, and why hunters became advocates for conservation way before it was a cool thing to do. Yeah, so. and the the author also writes in a very entertaining style. Too. Yeah. So like not only do you just learn a tremendous amount of history in that book, it's a very interesting read. I lis- I listened to it on an audio book and it was just like, I just listened to it straight through. Like, really? not, I mean, not, I mean like in the matter of a week probably. Yeah. Cause it was just like, I just wanted to continue to listen to it and you know, you know what the bummer is the is. day we got back from New Mexico he was in Bozeman giving a talk oh, really? about Dang. the book, about the history, and we were gone. <laughs> Damn it. No, that's a very good book. I, I, yeah. I read it on your recommendation, so, or listened to it, rather. I've heard a lot about that one. The that's Big Burn? Awesome. They, they made one. this into a, a series or a movie or something, didn't they? Oh, did they? I thought the, what, the, the, mov- the movie was about the Man Gulch fire. This one is about the fire... Uh, Timothy Egan, it's called The Big Burn, uh, and the subtitle is Teddy Roosevelt and the Fire That Saved America. And what it is, is I think it was in 1910, 1911? Wow, I should know. I've, I've read it, and now I'm forgetting the exact dates. But anyhow, right after the Forest Service was formed, uh, there was a fire in northern Idaho and northwest Montana that destroyed or burned 3 million acres, I think. Uh, And if you can imagine, the Forest Service was approved, but against the wishes of a lot of Western legislators. They did not like the idea of public lands and a Forest Service that was going to manage those lands. So this fire came two or three years after the Forest Service was was, uh, formed. And... It became kind of the political pry bar that politicians used to try to get rid of the Forest Service. Well, Gifford Pinchot was the first chief of the Forest Service, and he and Roosevelt had to do everything in their power to convince the, the lobbyists, the everything else, that the Forest Service had a a value had a purpose these lands were valuable Uh, but this burn over 100 years ago is a story of how the forest service formed and kind of what shaped the forest service today because as one of the side notes of it to kind of make congress uh, uh, i guess less aggressive they're still and always have been quite aggressive against the forest service at times pinchot had to say we we're going to adopt the policy that it's out by 10. In other words, if you see a fire, we're going to have it out the next morning by 10 a.m. So it kind of led us down the path we are today with a lot of fire suppression going <laughs> Which on. Which has had yeah, another interesting effect. <laughs> exactly. And and now the same country this year, this uh, August, September of 2017, the same area that this big burn happened, northern Idaho, northwest Montana, had probably the worst fires since... I've lived in Montana in 27 or 28 years. Uh, 100 years later. Yeah, 100 years later. So, uh, And I think it's causing a lot of people to think about, are we approaching this the right way? But The Big Burn, it's it's a great uh, book. Uh, Any of you who've done firefighting or know any wildland fires, you'll know about uh, the Pulaski. It's a tool. Yeah. And it's named after a ranger from northern Idaho. Uh, Ed Pulaski. Uh, he's part of the feature of this book. Uh, Another very book. entertaining, like, yeah. did, did exciting you get, book. Did you get that on Yeah, that's also, also on audiobook, yeah. I need more audio. I've, I don't own an audio When we're book. flying places or, yeah, that's the way to and, go. All right, I do. And this is the cue where we should be uh, pitching 
you know, the Amazon Audible whatever thing that we could get this, $2 uh, podcast, a piece from. This podcast <laughs> is not sponsored no, by Audible. No, we are not. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, hold on. What, what are you talking uh, about? I think Amazon has a deal where you, they partner with uh, podcasts and other groups where if you get people to sign up for their Audible service, which is a podcast thing, or not a podcast, an audio book service you get like two dollars per person that does the free trial or signs up or something like that how do we get in on you're in charge of that part <laughs> of this business i model. didn't think we we had a good enough alignment with what we talk about and you know audio books i, or I answer so many book <laughs> questions it's crazy how many book questions all right so I'll, don't get those books yet no We're wait get <laughs> wait wait for two weeks until the next podcast comes out and then we'll give you the right code or whatnot that we need to <laughs> so, take account for. I think every, yeah, every every other podcast out there is actually sponsored by Audible, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Sponsored. Like every single one. Are, are you quote. kidding yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> the hell it's we, very... Matthew, you're in charge of this monetization of the, this whole podcast. is kind of your baby. <laughs> I, I didn't think it was, it fit well enough with what we were doing, but if well, you want to change that, I can. I've uh, changed it. I can as you can you see. The thing is, though, I think I've looked up just about every one of these books, and only a few of them are actually on there. So okay, we well, need to convince Audible to <clears throat> put the rest of these on there. Yeah, this one is obscure and it's hard to find, mm-hmm. but it's really a cool one. I'm most. Uh, I'm halfway through it. It's called uh, "American Sportsman and the Origins of Conservation." Uh, John Rieger is the editor, and you got to get it from the Oregon State University Press. And this is about, it's just a back to chronological Hmm. versus bullshitters. (laughs) This guy is chronological. Okay. It's a chronological history of the conservation path we followed in the United States, starting back prior to world war to to the civil war uh then how the civil war disrupted the conservation movement and then how it picked up steam again 20 or 30 years later in the 1880s uh it's i I, i'm enjoying this one uh very good and this one here is interesting it's it's not as much chronological uh daniel herman it's called hunting in the american imagination it's kind of how hunters uh, have been how our image has changed uh, the the image society has of us and how it's how a lot of the image of hunters is connected to religion. Hmm. It's amazing that when pioneers and settlers came to the United States, they held certain religious beliefs. One of those religious beliefs was uh, among many of the early religions that that came here was that farming. And being a farmer was kind of like you are really moving up the ladder of your position and your your kind of held uh, status hmm. among your religion. Well, farmers hated, they called them the backcountry woodsmen, the hunters, because they're running around their farms, chasing game, lighting fires to improve wildlife habitat and burning down farms. And so there's a lot of religious uh, beliefs or or principles of the early uh, folks who came over from Europe uh, in in how the, the image of hunters has been held throughout time. And so this book does a really good job of bringing us way forward and explaining about how the image of hunting and hunters uh, what are you doing there, Michael? <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Your whiteboard just fell on me. Michael fell asleep over there and knocked the, white, <laughs> knocked the whiteboard off the wall. We didn't have enough picture books for him. So, I, re- I really want to read that book. I, I want to. I'll loan it to you. All right. Uh, I think. Well, you can see. There you go. I'm I'm two thirds of the way through it, but uh, I sometimes when I'm on planes and stuff, I'm like skipping a chapter ahead because it's like <laughs> I want to know what's next. So. Let's see. What else we got here? Oh, this is one everybody should have. Uh, Alan Morris Jones is very much an understated and underappreciated writer. Uh, He's from Montana, but he wrote a book called A Quiet Place of Violence. The subtitle is Hunting and Ethics in the Missouri River Breaks. And maybe for me, it's just because we've hunted 
the breaks country a lot. Uh, this bull right here above us, Matthew shot that up in the breaks, not far from where uh, Alan was writing this. But it's uh, it's a really really good book. If if you haven't, uh, and it's not that long. What is it? It's you know 180 pages of pretty easy text. Uh, but it's really, really a good book. Uh, Alan Morris Jones, A Quiet Place of Violence. Uh, great book. Marcus just grabbed uh, another one, shameless plug for my buddy Steve, uh, uh, the Meat Eater book. He's, he's got a couple of them out there. He's got, what's my other one I got? American Buffalo is the other one that he uh, Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, so you'd be hard-pressed to go wrong with any of Steve's books. And uh, he writes in an exciting style, too. I, I like Steve's mm -hmm. uh, way of writing. Um, and I don't know if those are out on audio. Uh, what do you call it? Audible? Audible. They are. Audi audio book is fine. Okay. Yeah, we're, not, we're not plugging anybody yet, so. Yeah. Oh, right. Don't do that until, <laughs> Matthew, until yeah. Matthew gets us signed up here. And then this one is just an absolute comedy book. Uh, it, not intending to be comedy. It's a fly rod of your own by John Garrick. Uh, it's it is really really a good book, and at his age and all the things he's seen, he has a sense of humor that just strikes me as hilarious. I was reading this on the plane a few weeks ago, and I'm over there chuckling, and people are looking at me like, "What's this guy reading, man?" <laughs> and they see it's a fishing book. And I'm sure they're thinking, no, that guy isn't right. But And then this one here that Marcus just picked up is, it's Blood Ties. It's by a very good friend of mine, Ted Carasotti. Uh Ted and his perspectives about interaction with wild things and wild animals, uh, probably him and Shane Mahoney have influenced me as much as anybody about my connection to other species. Uh, it's... This Blood Ties book from Ted is is remarkable. Uh, I think it's super, super good. Uh, he's got another book out, uh, Pucka's Promise. I don't see it on my shelf here. It must be tucked away somewhere else. But uh, uh, Merle's Door. Yeah, there. he wrote Merle's Door, which is about him and his dog Merle. But in the next bo dog book he did called Pucka's Promise, P-U-K-K-A-S. Can't remember what chapter it is. But he writes about hunting for acquisition of food. And Ted is as hardworking of a writer as you'll ever meet. He interviewed so many scientists about what is the lowest carbon footprint to acquire high quality protein. So he takes this whole chapter of a book and understand that these dog books are mostly written for an audience that are, and Ted will probably kick me for saying this, but mostly urban women who have a high affinity for their pets. They love reading Ted's dog books because mm -hmm. they're dog owners. Well, he took a whole chapter out of that book and talked about how he elk hunts. Ted lives in Jackson, Wyoming, Kelly, Wyoming, and... He hunts there for his food. And he makes the most compelling case I've ever read uh, as far as the, a case of making it easy to, for someone to understand in one chapter of a book why hunting is this food pursuit that is so natural, so connected, and in so many ways what we probably, as many of us as possible, we should be doing it that way. And uh, I've always admired Ted in his writings uh, and the times we talk and have conversations. Uh, but uh, that, that chapter in his book, Pucka's Promise, is unbelievable. And it, it's kind of taking a lot of what the last third of Blood Ties is. And he take, in Blood Ties, he takes a long time to, to make this whole case. Well, 15 or 18 years later, 20 years later, comes Pucka's Promise. And he's really refined it by this point. So yeah. uh, anyhow, that's what's on my bookshelf. I thought since we're sitting here, you see a bunch more of them off mm -hmm. camera there on that table. Uh, a bunch of them are James Willard Schultz. Uh, he was a guy who came to Montana uh, and lived with the Blackfeet, a very prolific writer and documented 
the destruction of the, the liquidation of the bison herds, uh, kind of as a tool to get the Blackfeet to where the government wanted them on their reservation. And hmm. So those are very good books. I could go on and on about books. Where do you get all this time to read? Uh, I don't know. That's where the audible comes <laughs> yeah. in. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, audiobooks. <laughs> well, I, I don't have any other vices, Michael. I don't sure. drink. I don't smoke. That's I true. don't, uh, I mean, so what else am I going to do? That's if true. you're, if you're a Minnesota Vikings fan, most of the time on <laughs> Sunday afternoon, you turn the TV off after the first <laughs> quarter. Hey, they're what? Five and two right now. They're not doing so bad. Well, let's not get our hopes up, Matthew. All you Packers <laughs> fans out there listening to this are going to give me grief for being a Vikings fan. But So what else are we going to solve of the world's problems today? Huh. Well, we got to, are we cutting up that moose today? No, we're not. Matthew's got to go to Billings. Oh. Either that or the three of us are going to cut it up. All right. But I got another conference call after lunch. So, <laughs> so tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. Tomorrow we got to go do, we got to wrap up all the last little details of the interviews and stuff. Yep. The, yep. So that's what people don't understand when we're producing all this stuff. They think that you guys just walk around with a camera rolling every yeah. once in a while. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty much it. I have no idea how much work goes into this all the planning all the film permits the the scripting well we do all this storyboarding and the critters never follow it yeah for some reason they don't follow the script very well I I don't really understand it yeah. I feel like he doesn't follow the script very well either sometimes (laughs) really? was I off script? no I'm just saying I know what what used to happen when we'd give you a script, you'd be like, oh, I'm throwing this out and then just doing it myself. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I, style. I, I yeah. see Michael like nodding his head. Uh, well, I'm, I'm nodding my head because I like that style. <laughs> Scripts are boring and lame. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not so much a script as like just storyline. Storyline of trying to figure out what's the, what are the parts that we can control or that you like all the pieces that you want to touch on that we, you know, basically talk about before mm-hmm. the hunt in terms of is there a conservation story in the area or the natural history of the species or the area and all that stuff. Right. So that's the part that's storyboarded in, or at least in my mind. Right. It's not like I'm going to say, oh, and then the elk's going to walk out at 9.30 a.m. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's going to stand there broadside. No, like that, I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll write down little reminders and shot lists, like remember to establish the mornings and the evenings and da-da-da-da-da. But yeah. No, and that's and, pretty much as as confined as we can make it. Yeah, I mean, we, we just we leave home here and say, all right, we got to tie in either the story about the person who's with us, or the landscape, or the conservation story, or the species, or whatever. Kind of like the Arizona elk. Yeah, you know, we had no idea how that was going to unfold, but we did know we wanted to document the story of how hunting has been used as a tool to allow for aspen regeneration. Yep. In a burn. Mm-hmm. And uh, exactly. So that, that's about as, as big as we can get. Well, and then that's part of the reason why this job and hunting in itself is so exciting is that unknown. So you can, yeah. like, the fact that we don't have it scripted out, that's part of the the excitement and the, the adventure involved with every hunt. Yeah. But you guys, you guys are under way more pressure than any of us. Because if you don't have it rolling or get it right, say Matthew dumps that moose the other day and you're like, oh man, I wasn't, you know, something was a foul or... I was filming the wrong bush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, stories. Uh, yes. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't get second takes. No. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you, you learned that in Nevada, didn't you, Michael? Yeah. but that that, it happens so fast i uh, part of it is the crews we've always had have been really good at what they do and so i think it almost makes it look too easy for the audience because it's not like we're sitting in a tree stand and we know they're going to come down one of these two or three trails this is like wild and crazy Michael peeks over the lip and there's a group of antelope there with a couple bucks 
and they all scatter like goldfish getting away from the big shark. And he's got to think, okay, am I on the one that the hunter is on? Because they might be a hundred yards apart. Uh, yeah. not, I mean, the, the two bucks or the three bucks. Well, well yeah. And especially with an, animals like antelope, where, you know, the difference between one buck and another buck is yeah, like pretty, two or three inches or right. like a, a little bit bigger of a prong. And you're, exactly. I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily get super close to antelope all the time. Yeah. I mean, if you're 300 yards away and there's a herd of them and there's two bucks in the herd and all the rest are does, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, I was running into that same problem yesterday. I wasn't sure if the cameraman was on the same antelope that I was on. Like set it up and like get back on the rifle. I'm like, is that the one that I'm filming? I, I don't know. I think so. <laughs> so. Well, at least with species like moose and, and even with elk, usually with elk, it's, we usually don't find them in big enough groups where it's like, oh, which one you on? Sometimes that's happened. Uh, Deer, uh, sometimes. Antelope Uh, is, I've I've found to be somewhat difficult because of, like I said, just because generally speaking, especially when you're so far away, they all look pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, especially through your little view. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the hunter's looking through binoculars, so he's got a huge yeah. advantage over you guys looking through the little viewfinder. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and especially, that, if, yeah, the, with the camera, depending on what settings you have the camera on, sometimes it's really hard yeah. to tell. Hard to tell what's and going And then on. the hunter says, right over there, that bush right over there. Yeah, well, there's, there's a thousand a, bushes yeah, exactly. over mm-hmm. there. And, <laughs> and in the moment, it's yeah. never like think of, think it out and like line it up it's like no this needs to happen right now yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but yeah, they usually don't stand around and wait but that being said too i mean i think I, I know from the hunts that i filmed this year i've not gotten the shot very well several times but i think that's that just is how a, it goes well and us. it's just a small yeah. part of the story too i mean I, I, in my mind it's more important to just capture the the whole hunt the hunt as a whole i mean that's pulling the trigger is that one small part about it and like it is i mean obviously it's like the critical kind of peak of the hunt and a lot of people do like watching that part but in my mind it's like not as important as right getting the you know reaction of the hunter and kind of the excitement and the adventure and showing all that is more important to me personally. But with talking with you, it seems like, you know, that's kind of the page that we've landed on. Right. If if the kill shot isn't perfect, I don't worry about it. Whereas some shows are like, Oh, I can't believe that. that, What a crappy kill shot. You know, I'm with you guys. That is like the, the very end of the needle it, it, you know the well, needle is three feet you want to get it for right. sure but i mean it's, it's just a for us if, if people just want to watch something because oh they want to see a bunch of animals you know flop yeah. and drop well they watch, can go watch that's, that, not uh, what, that's not what we're uh, about yeah. blank man <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to edit that part <laughs> out Mark. but uh so matthew yeah you're in charge of our Amazon channel. Is it a mm-hmm. channel or what is it? No, it's just a collection of things that we have on Amazon. So we have the last two series of Fresh Tracks. Two seasons. Two seasons. Seasons yeah. four and five. Yeah. We are filming season six. And that will that be on Amazon when we're all done this year? Mm, that's what I'm hoping it will be. Okay. And we're uh, we've got season three. We just need to find time to get it cut and edited for the Amazon format because yeah. Amazon is a, they got a freaking firewall that's like trying to get into Fort Knox or something. Yeah, it's not a firewall. It's just we can't well, we can't do what the standard operating procedure is for outdoor TV and Amazon just won't accept that. So right. There, we know mostly what we need to do. It's just actually going and doing it. And everything. So. One of the things Matthew and I were talking about on our drive home the other day is taking one of our longer YouTube day-to-day kind of hunts and making it one episode on Amazon. That's an hour, hour and a half long. It'd be a standalone movie. It wouldn't be a, a series. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That'd be and cool. And see if people like it. Yeah. 
I mean, like you're the elk you shot in Wyoming, Marcus, or Jim's antelope hunt yeah. in Wyoming. What would people think of that? I, would they sit down and watch an hour, hour and a half of hunting content? I think they would. I think people are hungry for that. I, I Everybody's seen the 20 minute episodes on TV of leaves blowing in the air and then eventually something getting shot. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yep. I think that we were talking about this the other day too. It's, it's cool. Cause especially with the day by day stuff. And if we can extend like, like what you guys are saying into an hour episode and you get to see all the, the failed stocks, all, you know, how it really goes down. Yeah. Um, all that stuff gets left on the cutting room floor for uh, majority of the other, TV show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So really showing the audience that like, yeah, we, we blow a couple stocks every trip. Always. It's, yeah. Always. It's, it's cool for them to see. And, uh, I think, I think people would like it and people seem mm -hmm. to like the day by day, the yeah. day by day stuff a lot. Yeah. On I mean, YouTube. I'm, yeah. I just cannot believe how many views that day by day stuff gets on our YouTube channel. The yeah. one day, the last day of Jim's antelope hunt, that the day we popped that the the last day of that hunt up there, that day we got what was it? That was our highest day ever, Matthew. Like Forty three thousand. Forty some thousand views that day. And for a hunting Crazy. YouTube channel, that's significant. That's I'd significant. say. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of views in yeah. one day. Yeah. For uh, one, yeah, I mean it's as as real as it gets that you can portray in video. I mean, there's no frills, no music, no right. anything. It's, it just it might not, and some days aren't that exciting but that's yeah. the that's way hunting like hunting is. Is. Yeah. yeah i mean some days are get, better than others i've yeah. I've seen a lot of people saying that they like it because it, it almost feels like you're right there with us you know yeah. and, I mean, and I, I think it's relatable because we're not just high grading a bunch of stuff that makes it seem so much different than how their hunts go mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, i am like as below average at everything we do the I, I'm you're, a little, you're real good at uh, cutting up animals, though. You know that? That's one thing. <laughs> yeah. I, we that's, just leave all of that to you. Right. But part of that is, and uh, uh, people have seen this now on some of the YouTube stuff because we tape it. We, we actually record Randy telling the guest hunter, I'm gutting and gilling your critter <laughs> because that, I can't explain why that is my favorite part of the hunt. So if you see Randy kind of diving in there and get out of my way, it's because if I don't have the tag, the next best thing is to be the guy on the knife. If you can't be the guy on the rifle, be the guy on the knife. So that is my only above average skill, Matthew. And that's just because I've done it hundreds of times. I'm right? pretty good at uh, like scoring antelope and stuff too on the hoof. <laughs> I, that's, I've, I've noticed that. But I've also been on long, all the pronghorn hunts with you this year. so yeah, That's just a fetish. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's not a skill. That's just a, a quirky problem I have. <laughs> but I want the viewer to understand that I am like as below average as anybody. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe that's not how you should be, but... Well, you do have the luxury, though, of you probably have more days in the field than the average person. So you got it. Your experience points are exceptionally higher than most. You you have <laughs> uh, you're probably in the top half a percent of people as far as number of days that you spend out in the field. So it seems unlikely that you are below average when you spend that much time out doing this. So. Well, if I'm <laughs> if I'm not below average, then why do I make so many mistakes? Because uh, everyone makes mistakes. Well, and it, it wouldn't be fun if you just went out there and got it perfect every yeah. time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it would. <laughs> well, why don't we just go up to Bear World and All just right. uh, well, start start <laughs> only planning two days for every hunt, one day to show up and get some film, and a second day to you know, shoot something and then just call it good. You'll, you'll have to get real good, real fast. <laughs> we're going to start, we're gonna have to go hunt some high fence operations. Yeah, if that, you if go. you wanted to success every time, then what's, um, you just go hunt those high fence operations. No, I, I'm not saying I want success every time. You just said, well, something to the effect of, well, you know, something about it going perfect. Well, yeah. I, I thought it was really cool on your Wyoming elk hunt where we walk out there 
We blow a few cow calls. Michael's like, here's a bull. He's coming in. <laughs> Just like not good footage, but it, it portrays really what went, went down. Yeah. And boom, you shoot him. I mean, is, uh, we've never had a hunt that went as good as that morning went. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that elk read the script. So yeah. I'm, I'm saying there's some benefit in not having to have, you know, disaster after disaster before we finally kill something. We've had a good track record this year. Yeah. I'll tell well, you that much. Well, this year, and it's like all hunting. Some years, everything goes your way. And some years, no matter how hard you work, you have the best plans. You just get on a streak of bad luck. And this year, we've been on a streak of good luck. That's uh, for sure. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, you know, some people would say, oh, you're just good. You know, they, they'd think to themselves, boy, I got this figured out. I've been hunting long enough to know as quick as I think I've got it figured out, I get my ass handed to me. So I just say, you know what? It's been just good luck. And and uh, you have been in the field a lot. That helps. The more days that you're out there, the better the chance that you're going to have success. <laughs> Definitely. <There's> this, <laughs> I have yet to tag an animal sitting on this couch watching TV. Yeah, and, no. <laughs> so, but when we were in Arizona, we were doing the math of how many days we would be in the field in 2017, and we came to 109. Of That's, just hunting, right? Or, well, hun hunting, hunting or hun travel hunting related. And, yeah, right. And a lot of days when we travel, we get there and we go and scout yep. a little yeah. bit that yep. evening. So, 109 days. And then there was more of being gone for oh yeah, all other the stuff related yeah, to the show, though, still, right? Yeah. But, so... I guess you're right, Matthew, to say that there aren't many people who spend 109 days traipsing around with a backpack, glassing critters, and trying to film some. But you get to make an awful lot of dumb mistakes in that process. And for me, the only progress I make is by making really dumb mistakes. <laughs> And then I figure out, hmm, probably ought not to do that again. But you would think you'd run out of dumb things to do. That Okay, I've done all the dumb things there are to do while hunting. And every year I find a whole, whole pile full of new dumb things to do. <laughs> like in New Mexico, right? On Tracy's elk hunt. I mean. What was I, the dumb thing there? I let us down in that hole. Oh, I thought that was and, a smart decision. No, that was stupid. <laughs> we need to do it. We did. We we were all in a hurry. We had to leave, so we didn't even get a podcast on this this hunt. But well, so Marcus and I are down there scouting early in the morning before season opens. We find what what we find twenty two bulls down in that canyon minimum. Yeah, and I think that the shoot shooting lanes are going to be good. And that they're only going to be 200-yard shots. Yeah, it looks like get there's out these to steep, narrow rock. canyons that you can shoot across, but... Yeah, so <laughs> we dropped 1,600... Well, we didn't go all the way to the bottom. We short-stopped on that rock. So we probably only dropped 1,000 feet Yeah. into this nasty burn canyon. And we get there, and there's not any shooting lanes. The few shooting lanes there are are four or 500 yards away. That was stupid. I knew... I always, I call it like a sucker's hole. You get sucked down in there because you're a sucker. And I've been down in those places enough to know that when you're in really thick burns, you don't have shooting lanes. But that being said, that's where all of the mature bulls were. Well, I know that, but. <laughs> and it, that they were there for that reason. Right. But you got to figure out a way to kill one of them yeah. when they're in there. And trying to thread shots at 400 yards through burnt timber is not the way to do it. But, I mean, as far as I didn't see any other mature bulls except down in that stuff. I, I mean, know. the biggest, the very large right. bulls anyway. Right. They were in sanctuary mode. Yep, but then the bad sure. part is it took us three hours with empty packs to climb out of that that night. There's yeah, another, that was, a, there's that another, was a poor decision. That we just thought that the old skid trail was going to be good. Right. That, that was my decision. <laughs> oh, let's go up to this old skid trail. It's nothing but grown-in aspens about 15 feet tall. And cat claw yeah, or whatever. That, I don't know yeah. if it was cat claw, but it right. just, just grabs hold. <laughs> yeah. By the time we got to the truck, I'm surprised nobody had beat me up by that time. <laughs> I think they just didn't have enough energy to, to beat me up. 
So you see, I mean, right there, one day I made two terrible decisions. I, I've, I have screwed up most every encounter of every trip this year, and somehow through good luck, we've filled enough tags and had enough stories to tell. Yeah. Well, with that, I think that we only have about eight minutes left on the camera recording. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you said we had 142 minutes to, to yeah. wrap this up, yep. and we're at 134 right now. All right. So, so was that I still see we, the we red light, quit? though. I think we're good. Does that but, mean yeah, we got to quit? Uh, just start wrapping up fairly soon here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> see, he's in charge of the podcast, so we will wrap it up then. All right. What what else we got to talk about? I don't know. What else do you want to talk about? Well, we want to make sure everybody goes to our YouTube channel. Yep. We want to. We really would like it if they'd share this podcast with their friends. Yeah, that'd be cool. We got to get Bo on a podcast yeah. about his llamas, and we got to sure. get Bruce and Tracy on a podcast about that New Mexico elk hunt. Both of those would be. And ideal. I'm bringing the podcast kit to Arizona. Okay. And if we shoot elk or a deer on the Kaibab. We're making Wade do a podcast. If we don't, we're, we should make Wade do a okay. podcast. Because the only guy who has <laughs> less words than Matthew is Wade. <laughs> Wait. And why do you want him on the podcast? Talk, occasionally. When he does get excited, he gets excited about birds. Yeah. I don't know if he gets excited about big meal there. Probably not. But but he is a bird well, nut. Yeah. So. so we got the... Oh, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Uh, Hold off on Audible. Go to <laughs> the... So just search Amazon video for either Randy Newberg or Fresh Tracks, and you should be able to find the two seasons that are up. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what's the deal on Audible? We, we, oh, we'll you, we'll just get the code next week, and uh, we'll <laughs> we'll. Uh, I had no idea. That. I'm here pitching books like crazy and stuff for for two years now. I've been pitching books, and you're mm-hmm. telling me we could be getting paid two dollars a, a crack. <laughs> not not a book per person that signs up. Well, for the whatever. I mean. Something like that. Yeah. Maybe 20 people will sign up. <laughs> that, that'll take care of our coffee budget for the next trip. For the, <laughs> yeah, for the next like three days. Yeah. <laughs> so what else? Fresh Tracks is on on Sunday nights on Sportsman's Channel. Uh, we run quarters three and quarters four. So we're almost done. Uh, end of December. Two more months. Yeah. We got our Hunt Talk Forum, where if you really want the inside details of what we're doing, go out to Hunt Talk. Uh, hunttalk.com it's a big talk forum it's all self-guided public land hunting and when I have time this year I feel so terrible to the guys out on hunt talk I've been so busy I haven't been able to write my long-winded stories I'm trying to remember they've I think, kind of come in the form of YouTube videos this year yeah, yeah. I wrote one story oh I wrote the Colorado uh, bull elk story oh, really? on hunt talk because nice. before I sent it to bugle magazine and it got printed in the current issue of bugle uh, I posted that story out on hunt talk cool with the links to the videos and all your pictures and stuff and but usually i do those like religiously and the hunt talk crowd reads them and i don't know it's i don't know why it's mostly bs i mean to make it up along the way <laughs> but um what other shameless po- plugs for everyone's instagram here so oh yeah yeah Michael, at, what's your Instagram at handle? At Michael Parenti. It's parent with an E on the end. <laughs> How you spell my last name? There's some badass average footage being laid down by that oh, guy. Oh, it's above average. <laughs> and <Nah>. Marcus, <laughs> what's your Instagram handle? At M Hockett. At M Hockett. H-O-C-K-E-T-T. Yep. And his wife, she's, she shot a huge mule deer opening weekend. Yep. She archery killed her bull elk opening week. Or the first week of season. Yeah. Or, yeah, day seven. So you just killed an antelope. Yep. So why would you even want to help us with this moose cutting party? You, your freezer's got to be full. It's pretty full. But you could fit some moose meat in there? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a little moose meat. All right. I, just to have, you know, some variety. I don't need a lot, but I, I might take a little if you guys well, are willing to give yeah. up a, that, a little that bit. That tongue's still floating around somewhere. Yeah, that we'll, tongue is We'll deal with that. It, we're going to boil that for about a half hour and then yeah. uh, skin right. it, and then okay. maybe it'll, we'll okay. see what it looks like. Okay. <laughs> and my Instagram is at Randy Newberg Hunter. Yeah. And Matthew or George? Mine's just at Matthew Newberg. Okay. Uh, where else people need to get a hold of us? Our Facebook page, Randy Newberg Hunter. Yeah. 
Twitter, although I don't Twitter. know. How I don't think I've is. tweeted in like a long time. I don't <laughs> want people you know, to see my I, Twitter. I don't. <laughs> I am so lucky to have Michelle Schurman at Bulletproof Communications handle my my Twitter and Facebook stuff because I'm just too one. I'm too busy. Two, it would look like an accountant wrote it, and so she ha she somehow has linked my Twitter to my Facebook or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. I I don't know. I I'm I'm just not into tweeting i i understand twitter uh less than you understand instagram i really i have no idea what twitter is <laughs> do, do we need right. to sign him up for a snapchat or whatever the kids use these days uh, whatever do you, them kids you know, use these days I, <laughs> <laughs> I i have migrated from hunt talk to me hunt talk is like social media for hunters <laughs> and, and now you guys got me over here and all this other stuff and it just it's not my style man mm -hmm. so did we get all the plugs in there? I think we got everything. Plus, we got Leupold, Onyx Maps, Orion Coolers, and GoHunt.com. We got a a good backlog of footage that'll be coming out in the next couple months, I'd say, on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Good point, Michael, because we try to put a YouTube video up every day, but when we're out in the field, you guys just don't have time to get it edited. Oh, it's, yeah. So. It's, we, we were pretty ambitious about it in the beginning of the year. I think we have a, a good idea going forward yeah uh, for what needs to be yeah. done someone needs yeah it has to be separate someone has to be editing not filming yeah yeah because yeah. if you're filming and then trying to edit you're yeah. just like your mind just gone <laughs> it just doesn't work in the moment you have to have a, a separate time yeah well folks thanks for listening that's what's happening in bozeman montana today besides the fact that it snowed this morning yeah. and uh we got a whole lot of moose meat we got to start cutting on here and until the next time, from the next time will be the Kaibab Plateau in Arizona. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a good season. Hope you have a lot of fun and be safe.